in a few seconds from now we will be starting today's session and we are extremely glad to welcome professor dr vijay kumar singh ji dr vijay kumar agarwal ji advocate victor lemos dr sebastian janka advocate zameer nathani and of course dr sanjay pandey ji good afternoon everyone good evening everyone namaskar welcome to mit world peace university and to international symposium on law and peace we can start pranima sure ma namaste good evening good morning good afternoon to this august gathering and all the participants joining from different parts of the world i dr pranima bakchi welcome you on behalf of dr vishwanath karad mit world peace universities school of law to the first international symposium on law and peace on the theme role of law to promote the culture of peace as per the tradition of mit world peace university we would like to begin the very third session of the whole symposium and specially this plenary session of the first ISLP with the world peace prayer i request everyone to join your hands close your eyes and pray to the divine almighty i also request my technical team to kindly relay the world peace prayer om namo ji adya प्रतिपाद्य जय जय स्वसंवेद्या आत्मूप देवाति गणेश सकलाथमति प्रकाश मणे निवृत्ति अवधारी बोधी गुरुर्ब्रह्मा गुरुर्विष्णु गुरुर्देव महेश्वर गुरु साक्षात पर ब्रह्म श्री गुरव नम ओ पूर्णमद पूर्णमद पूर्णमुदच्यते पूर्णश पूर्णमादा पूर्णमेवशिष्य शाति 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 थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर योर होल हार्टेड पार्टिसिपेशन thank you indeed well we experienced an overwhelming participation in the inaugural as well as the two plenary sessions of the first international symposium on law and peace organized by mit world peace university in association with the pune district bar association so let me begin by asking you all a few questions can we imagine the market without competition can the free market remain safe from monopolies are the competition antitrust laws proper safeguards of freedom ladies and gentlemen i once again welcome you all to the third plenary session of islp which is on the theme changing dimensions of competition law antitrust law we are about to witness an interesting deliberation by all the dignitaries present on the online days dear participants it is my privilege to welcome the moderator of this session 
Professor Dr. Vijay Kumar Singh, former Deputy Director, Competition Commission of India, as well as the Dean of Faculty of Law from the University of Petroleum of and Energy Studies, Dehradun, Bharat. Welcome, sir. Dr. Vijay Kumar Singh is an experienced faculty of law with a demonstrated history of working with academia, national regulator from CCI, and a government think tank IICA under the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. He's skilled in corporate and securities laws, competition law and policy, insolvency, alternate dispute resolution, international trade, public speaking, and administration. He's a strong professional with a PhD in law and higher degrees in law and management. We are honored to have you, sir. My friends, it is my honor and privilege to welcome the chair of this session, Dr. Sanjay Kumar Pandeji. Sir has a varied knowledge and exposure. He has an illustrious academic, administrative, and professional career spanning over two decades. Dr. Pandey is presently the advisor with Competition Commission of India and heads advocacy division of the commission. He has been a founder faculty of National Law University, Jodhpur. He has conducted intellectual property awareness programs for Department of Science and Technology, Government of Rajasthan during the years 2004 to 2006. Dr. Pandey has been an EUVP, that is European Union Visitors Program Aluminus, and represented India in 2007 as a young university educator. He has been a member of the Interministerial Committee on Competition Assessment of Legislations. He served as an officer on special duty and secretary to former union minister, late Sri Arun Jaitliji. Dr. Pandey represents the Competition Commission of India at national and international forums, including OECD, UNCTAD, BRICS, ICA, and so on and so forth. He has been instrumental in implementation of various novel initiatives of the commission, including the SRP scheme and the NICE network. Dr. Pandey is an alumnus of Delhi University and has two books and more than a dozens of research articles to his credit. His research interest lies in the interface of law economics and public policy. We are honored to welcome Dr. Sanjay Pandey, sir. I'm sure we'll be joined by him very shortly. Dear friends, we are deeply honored to have Mr. Zameer Nathani, Senior Vice President and General Counsel, UFO Movies Limited Bharat. Mr. Zameer Nathani is one of the most notable legal luminaries within the corporate fraternity. He holds a master's degree in law and certifications from World Intellectual Property Office Academy, United Nations. Zameer's corporate career began when he joined Malar Law Consultancy right after graduation. Thereafter, he was the Digital Businesses Associate Vice President Legal at Reliance Entertainment. He later joined Balaji Telefilms, where he worked as head legal. In the meantime, he has managed to pursue an executive MBA from NMIMS. Sir is currently the Director Legal at Raymond Limited and is also the Honorable Chairman of Entertainment and Media Section at Indian National Bar Association. Welcome, sir. We are honored to have you. Ladies and gentlemen, I feel extremely glad to welcome our next guest, Advocate Victor Lemus. Advocate Victor Lemus is a partner at Advocate Columbia, Master in Global Business Law and in Laws at Pontificia Universidad Zavernia. Lawyer from the Pontificia Universidad, he's a specialist in political, economic, and social sciences from the University of Notre Dame, Indiana. Master of Laws in Global Business Law from New York University, he pursued his LLM in Global Business Law and Master of Laws from National University of Singapore. He has worked as a coordinator of the Center for Competition Law Studies, as well as served as the professor of the Competition Law Chair at the Pontificia Universidad Zaveria. Sir, we are honored to have you. Welcome to this August gathering. Dear delegates, it's now indeed my great fortune to welcome Dr. Vijay Kumar Agarwalji, Senior Consultant 
Competition Law and Policy, Lexendis Law Offices, Delhi, Bharat. Dr. Vijay Kumar Agarwal is a PhD holder, Master in Commerce and Diploma holder in Labor Laws. He also owns various publications under his name, including a book on Indian competition law analysis of substantive provisions and decisional practices and an online certificate course titled as Analytical Jurisprudence of Competition Law in India for Manupatra. He is a vice president of Competition Law Bar Association, ex-honorary secretary of MRTP Commission, Along with the many other associations, he is also a distinguished member of International Council of Jurists at London. Welcome, sir. We are indeed honored to have you on this online day. Friends, it is now indeed my privilege to welcome Dr. Sebastian Janka, partner for antitrust and competition law at Luther Restan Walsda Shaf. BH, Greater Munich, Metropolitan Area from Germany. Dr. Sebastian Janka advises national and international clients on European and German antitrust law. Another focus of his work is digital business models. Moreover, having studied and worked in Germany, France, South Africa, Argentina, and the United States, Sebastian Janka has a very international focus. He has authored numerous publications on matters relating to antitrust and sports law. He is recognized by various publications such as Best Lawyers, Who's Who Legal, The Legal 500, and Jew. Welcome, sir. Thank you so much for coming to this gathering. Friends, it is indeed our honor and privilege to have such a distinguished panel. And I now request Professor Anuradha Parasar, Dean of School of Law, Faculty of Liberal Arts, School of Visual Arts, and School of Performing Arts to kindly get address the gathering. Ma'am, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Bhagji, and Southern Namaskar to one and all. Respected uh, dignitaries on the dais, distinguished, honorable members of legal fraternity who are attending this meeting online, as well as those who are present here in this meeting, respected Honorable Chief Justice, Honorable Justice of Supreme Court, High Courts, Honorable Sitting Judges, Honorable Former Judges, Distinguished Senior Advocates, members of Bar Association, Advocates, Lawyers, Fellow Colleagues, Participants, members from Media and Press, Faculty Staff, and my dear students. A uh, very good evening to one and all. Uh, in India, it is 5.30 right now. So good morning or good evening or as per your respective time zone, are my heartfelt greetings to all of you. And welcome one and all to this technical session on changing dimension of competition law of First International Symposium on Law and Peace at Dr. Vishwanath Karar, MIT World Peace University, Pune Bharat. MIT World Peace University is organizing this prestigious conference, symposium in fact, in association with Pune District Bar Association. And this conference is planned from December 14 to 17. Yesterday we had a very grand inaugural session. And the theme of the symposium is role of law to promote the culture of peace. Here, I wish to express gratitude and thanks to a good number of dignitaries and respected uh, honorable uh, personalities who has helped in shaping this symposium. I wish to express gratitude and thanks to honorable revered Professor Dr. Vishnu Karat, President MIT World Peace University. We express gratitude to MIT WPU's International Symposium on Law and Peace patrons and organizing chairs, Honorable Executive President, Sri Rahul Vikarat, and to Dr. Lalit Basinji. We also express gratitude to MIT World Peace University's School of Law Advisory Board members for their contributions. Sri Nani Krupaniji, Justice Dilip Karnak, Advocate Makran Dadkar, Advocate Satish Manishinde, Advocate Anand Desai, 
एडवोकेट अनिकेत निकम एडवोकेट रवि किनी एडवोकेट राजेंद्र शिरोडकर सो मेनी पीपल ऑफ कॉर्स हुम वी नीड टू अक्नोलेज एडवोकेट मोहन पुंगालिया जी एडवोकेट मृणालिनी देशमुख प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर के एल भाटिया प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर दिलीप उके एडवोकेट सुधीर वाकुरे एडवोकेट अनिता अग्रवाल एडवोकेट आदित्य प्रताप एडवोकेट कोमल जोशी एडवोकेट कपिल खैर एंड एडवोकेट सतीश मलिक आई ऑल्सो टेक दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू वेलकम एंड एक्सप्रेस ग्रेटिट्यूड टू ऑल लीगल ह्यूमनरीज द डिस्टिंग्विश स्पीकर्स गेस्ट ऑफ ऑनर एंड शेयर पर्सन फॉर द ट्रे सेशन to this technical session and all the legal jewelry we are so feeling so good that you are here you have spared your time and you are here to share your perspective and wisdom words with all the participants so thanks for sharing uh, for being here with us and for gracing this virtual dais of international symposium on law and peace and we keenly look forward to your address on changing dimension of competition law thank you vande matram jai hind thank you thank you so much ma'am and uh, dear audience before we have the formal welcome address from subarao sir i am glad to mention that we are indeed honored to have joined by the chair of this session dr sanjay kumar pande ji sir welcome welcome to this august gathering indeed this gathering has become more august with your presence and uh, just to mention very quickly so is present to the advisor with competition commission of india yes advocacy division of the thank you sir thank you so much thank you sir thank you so much for joining with us today and we are really glad to welcome you dear friends now it's time that i request dr subarao professor and dean of school of management at mit world peace to kindly propose the welcome address sir over to you uh, good evening ma'am good evening uh, good evening thank you for giving this opportunity first of all on behalf of the entire mit world peace university family i am welcoming all the distinguished legal fraternity the honorable judges honorable members of the various committees and the various organizations and particularly i am inviting on behalf of the mit professor dr vijay kumar singh who is the former deputy director competition commission and i am also inviting the chief of this today's session in the dr sanjay pandey and uh, mr jamir natani who is the senior vice president and general counsel ufo movies and the advocate victor lemos from colombia dr vijay kumar agarwal senior consultant competition law and policy and i am also invite the today's another speaker dr sebastian jenka from germany in that it's a great panel which is representing almost the three continents in that we are very happy to make it in that and uh, first of all i congratulate dr anudradha parasar madam and pronima madam and all for the school of law for organizing such an excellent event and choosing the very most important topics of the all the technical sessions in that as you all aware about that competition lies a classical example wherein the government wants to meet the compelling needs of the changing times we all aware about that indian monopolies restrictive trade practice act mrtp act was enacted in the era of a restrictive economy in the opening of the economy in the year 1991 and subsequent advent of the wto in 1995 it was felt that there is a no need for the mrtp act and uh, had outlined its uh, utility and no longer served its purpose in the changed environment while the new open market economy would ensure adequate competition and at the same time experience in other countries had indicated that some enterprises do try to undermine the market by restoring to anti competition practices hence it was felt uh, that such practices could nullify the gains from competition which could be answered only by having a 
new competition law. Accordingly, the Competition Act 2002 was enacted. However, only some parts of the act are in force and the entire act is yet become operative. This technical session with experts from judiciary, from uh, various law firms um, in, from Bharat and uh, globally, will make a modest attempt to discuss this new competition regime, its scope, ambit, and various dimensions, and to explain whether it will face further new challenges due to dynamism in international trade and economic loss in the era of globalization. Because globalization is a must, in this globalized world, how we can make this competition more effectively and smoothly in that. Now, I'm opening this session to all the experts to make the uh, more useful discussions for the entire legal fraternity in that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing such important insights with all of us. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, before we proceed, I would like to request all the panelists to kindly turn on their cameras, wear a beautiful smile so that we can capture this special moment that we are experiencing of heralding law to promote peace. It is indeed uh, in the new normal that I think we practice taking group photographs in this way. And this is how I think we can capture this very special moment of the third plenary session in the first ISLP. I request my technical team to capture the group photograph and I request all the panelists to turn on their videos. Thank you, thank you so much. Dear delegates, we are now heralding towards the third plenary session. This conference being organized under the guidance and expertise of Honorable Executive President of MIT World Peace University, Sri Rahul Vikarat, is envisaged to initiate dialogue between lawyers, judges, policymakers, jurists, academicians, youth, and industry experts. I now kindly request my technical team to relay a short film on the theme of this session. Over to my technical team. Competition is the best means of ensuring that the common man gets access to a variety of goods and services at a competitive rate. Increased competition is healthy for an economy, which will help in maximizing incentives for innovation and creating new products in the market. The Competition Act primarily seeks to regulate three types of conduct. Anti-competitive agreements, abuse of a dominant position, and combinations that is mergers, acquisitions and amalgamations. The Competition Act monitors any economic activity that monopolizes competition within the market. It aims to protect consumers and small enterprises and ensures freedom of trade. This session will help us to unpack the various dimensions of competition law and its implementation in the country. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would now like to formally hand over the session to the moderator, Professor Dr. Vijay Kumar Singh, former Deputy Director of Competition Commission of India, as well as the Dean of Faculty of Law at the University of Petroleum and Energy Studies, Dehradun, Bharat. Sir, over to you. Thank you, uh, Pranima, for uh, such a nice uh, introduction. And uh, actually introducing the topic very well, in fact, with a small video which uh, explains the basics of competition as to how important this topic is. As far as I am concerned uh, uh, on this particular topic, uh, when I got the schedule, uh, when I got the speakers list, I was quite happy to see that we are having people from different continents and different perspectives is going to come. Uh, in this, I'm... Uh, I would like to welcome everybody uh, to this session. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, WPU University for inviting me for this uh, event. And when I look at the theme of the international conference, that is role of law to promote the culture of peace, I believe that goes to the core of the SDG goal number 16, which talks about uh, you know, rule of law achieving rule of law in achieving the sustainable development goals as well. So 
law is ingrained into each and every dimension and if the implementation of law is not proper uh, then probably we are not going to achieve or reach to a level which we are wanting to that also applies to the competition space so if we look at the perspective but before i move on to the competition space uh, let me also congratulate uh, you uh, the team behind the you know planning of this particular conference uh, specifically choosing the very very important areas because i looked at the session plan and this is the uh, day, day, uh, you know session number 3 and i see eight eight sessions are lined up on different topics all these are very very important topics and i want one more session on ipr and competition law which is going to be there so competition two two sessions specifically and uh, when we look at competition law basically competition law goes to the basics of peace because if you want to really want to have a peaceful society you need to have fair competition because if you don't have fair competition uh, you know people will be competing and cutting each other there is no point on that particular kind of a competition and that is where the role of the competition regulator comes into picture if you look at the objective of the competition law is basically to you know take care of the situations of uh, excesses by the market players uh, which goes against the uh, their fellow competitors or the consumers and at the same time there is also a duty towards the consumers to protect the consumers and i'm sure our panelists uh, would be addressing these uh, different dimensions so what i intend to do is that uh, maybe i will reserve my time uh, to uh, you know give a brief comment after each of the speakers speak so that uh, i am able to uh, you know integrate the different speeches and i think uh, we have already lined up these speeches so uh, it is it is about 10 minutes for each of these speakers and we will go in order and to begin with uh, let us hear dr sanjay pandey dr sanjay pandey uh, happens to be my senior when i was in competition commission i was reporting to him directly and i have worked with him very very closely so he is an academician by heart and uh, being chairman of this session Uh, we are going to hear from him and in particular i would like to uh, you know bring forward the three major dimensions of competition law which he will be addressing one which relates to advocacy efforts of competition law uh, second is internationalization because we are in an international conference we would like to hear the perspective on internationalization that how that is helping because there is a lot of effort happening for on the international space international perspective because we want to bring a commonality of principles as far as application of competition law is concerned and that is being done um, by way of uh, different uh, organizations different bodies so we would like to hear um, from him that and any latest trends which is happening in competition law jurisprudence uh, these are the three major uh, important areas on which i would request dr pandey to address the um, audience and bring forward some important issues so over to you sir thank you thank you vijay and um, thank you everyone for inviting me and uh, initial there was a hiccup in getting connected probably i am um, through and uh, thank you all as uh, professor vijay has identified a uh, few uh, niche areas uh, what we are uh, thinking about in today's world Uh, and the topic of this is and also uh, chills with that that we are looking at new dimensions new virtuous things so uh, well uh, let's uh, set the tone because we have a good number of speakers but before that uh, there are two things which i'll uh, like to share with you all first that my uh, opinion or my ideas what i'm going to share with you these are all my personal and it has uh, nothing to do or Uh, or nothing bearing with respect to Composition Commission of India. These are not official positions, and uh, this is all my personal understanding of the law and policy as I visualize and read. Second, uh, given the new normal of uh, this uh, various online meetings, uh, I have got another meeting at five uh, forty-five. That is an international uh, meeting which I have to join. So I'll attend till that time. And then uh, I'll take notes from uh, Professor Vijay 
and uh, try to catch up with uh, the recording also later on. So let me uh, begin with uh, competition. We all uh, uh, what we know today. It does. Uh, uh, it has got uh, economic and social functions. Now, on uh, economic function side, we say uh, competition has to coordinate uh, production and consumer needs in such a way that, in the long run, supplied goods and services will be adequate to the demand. So, differently, demand and supply must match, and competition is a uh, you can say uh, just like an infrastructure which facilitates it. A precondition for optimal coordination is an efficiency uh, working price mechanism, which indicates the degree of scarcity of goods. So what prices people are going to pay, consumers are going to pay, and the availability of goods, they should match. We are not talking about anything called profit competition in economic sense. We're talking about competition law and policy. The basic economic functions uh, as we uh, look into these are uh, generally static. Uh, they are complemented by some dynamic functions and the competition is the driving force behind technological progress. And law processes, innovation of products and production process is the key to attaining preferential positions within the competition process. Every company strives for modernization. Now, uh, additionally, companies are forced to adapt their competitive parameters continuously because market conditions are a never ending process of change. Now, these uh, economic uh, rationals are the driving force. At the same time, uh, competition does the social functions as well by opening opportunity to all market participants. Entrepreneurs have the possibility to decide solely responsible for the use of their available resources. So consumers have freedom of choice. Several alternatives and workers have chance of getting jobs more. If they want to change jobs, there is a market for that. Now, these two functions combine the bedrock of competition. But what we are finding, let's begin from uh, the latest developments, that uh, we uh, have uh, developments going on in competition arena in the last, uh, say, uh, two decades. And these developments are relating to innovation and technology. And what was visualized, say, uh, two, three decades back, it is completely different today. So uh, this entire idea is uh, captured in uh, the word what we say as digital markets. And I believe many of you are going to touch upon these uh, issues as well. Now, digital markets are uh, often uh, characterized by network effects, economies of scale, the aggregation of large amounts of data, platform business models, and the ecosystem. Now, these are not jargons. They are appearing in a very relevant time and a perspective. These features of digital market make them particularly prone to tip in favor of a dominant incumbent. Now, these are all uh, terms and terminology which gets uh, complicated with more and more understanding of the scenario. Now, these issues of uh, dominance, they entrench the position, hindering the chances for new firms to compete and grow, and next generation innovation to emerge. So uh, it's a, a sword which uh, creates an entry barrier at the same time, on technological innovation also, there is a catch. Now, competition must address what we understand, uh, the barriers to entry of new and challenging parts of digital market. Now, this is the whole dimension, what we are looking at. Now, what happens? That uh, competition issues can result from uh, increased importance of quantitative and qualitative user data also. Because when we talk about uh, digital arena or we talk about platform economy, all concern becomes about the data and what we use, quote unquote, as big data. And now, big data, if concentrated in few hands on one hand or limited number of players, definitely fair competitive market structure may be good to your party. So in particular, when platforms automatically buy and sell advertising space in their role as intermediary 
between advertisers and content providers. One example, which we have seen there are cases uh, decided in many jurisdictions. Now, in the whole scenario, we uh, look into uh, some sort of vertical agreements also. These are all uh, created under uh, a cross platform parity agreements. Now, these create further issues. So, uh, uh, the position gets entrenched. Another point comes, that is the market definition. Now, market definition in the whole uh, digital arena becomes uh, a complex. There are, uh, it raises a myriad of issues, uh, three of which stand out on the relationship we say as uh, zero price, uh, multi-sided platforms, and the digital ecosystem. Now, uh, these are uh, creating sort of uh, fuzzy things for uh, uh, practitioners as well as uh, the enforcers. Now, uh, on uh, determination uh, of a monopoly part, uh, we used to have a test called slip test. Now, uh, applying this test in order to uh, understand the digital market, things are getting complex. So, uh, uh, competition authorities across the world, they have started using or devising their own techniques. And majority of uh, authorities, they have been including uh, in India that uh, the current framework of competition law is uh, good enough to handle these issues. And in India also, a couple of cases have been decided. And these reveal that in the current framework, these cases have been handled. Now, how things will uh, happen in course of time, that time will decide. But in case of platforms, there are issues also. When we say that the multi-sided platforms, network effect, uh, we start looking into the transaction platform or non-transaction platform. So uh, looking into the market and uh, having uh, a relevant market as the law says, because we talk about the relevant market, then we talk about relevant product market, then uh, the relevant geographic market. Now, these issues, they appear uh, easy to uh, listen and see from outside, but quite complex to uh, find out uh, some sort of a uh, uh, reasonableness uh, between uh, what is happening and the fact and the law, and then decision comes. Otherwise, definitely they are prone to uh, issues of judicial scrutiny. And that we have seen uh, in the uh, beginning of, uh, uh, I believe, uh, 2007, eight, that the courts were saying about zero price that there's no question of market. Now, coming to the point of advocacy, uh, what we uh, find that uh, enforcement is uh, given the controls of uh, uh, technology and also of uh, things happening in uh, the digital space, uh, there are newer things coming in, uh, which many of us as part of uh, the legal community or fraternity might not be aware about but they are making things more complex, like uh, blockchain uh, uh, and uh, in platform also, there are a whole lot of new issues to look into it actually. Now CCI uh, has uh, identified uh, a twin mechanism that is uh, a blending uh, advocacy with enforcement. So uh, if you look into uh, the uh, market studies of CCI, uh, CCI is uh, proactively stating about uh, the condition of market. At the same time, CCI is highlighting that uh, self-regulation is also a best way to minimize cost of enforcement. Now, uh, telling the participants about importance of competition law and also issues which can be avoided at the very uh, nascent stage for uh, support CCI is uh, providing all sorts of uh, advocacy endeavors to uh, enterprises or various other communities also. Now, this twin approach of enforcement and advocacy is definitely helping. We uh, refer to uh, the cases of international dimension. Now, what do we find? That internationally, look into developments in Europe uh, that a few countries are thinking about uh, new laws because uh, the existing competition law is not sufficient enough to handle the challenges posed by digital economy. 
So they are contemplating new laws. Some of them they have brought. Other countries are also thinking about. Now these are uh, requiring uh, the jurisdictions to come together and think about a new mechanism. Now this leads to a wider international cooperation. So what is happening all across the world that competition authorities they are joining hands. They are trying to understand from each other, and they are taking some sort of a collective uh, decision in the way that uh, they will follow, or uh, there is a, a jurisdictional uh, uh, uniformity that these cases are going to happen in different jurisdictions. So how they are going to handle it and come out with a uh, solution. Now, uh, uh, I will not take much time because uh, I have been allocated limited time. I simply wanted to flag uh, these issues and there are plenty to talk about on these issues. With this, I will uh, uh, give my voice rest and uh, hand it over to uh, Professor Vijay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, I think uh, uh, you have covered our uh, largest case and in fact uh, brought up a very, very important dimension of uh, big data and efficiency and a, a very, very crucial, uh, you know, balance between economic and social function of the competition law. And I think that is very, very important to bring about, which many of us uh, leave behind, because if we see the evolution of the MRTP Act and the competition, one of the major question around constitution is this, and I believe the modern researchers uh, should look at that, the competition law researchers should look at that, and I see the a good audience in this uh, session attending this uh, changing landscape or changing dimension in the competition law. So uh, you also brought up about uh, uh, the concept of uh, culture advo uh, through advocacy, which Competition Commission is building. And indeed, uh, a marvelous work being carried out by the commission as far as building culture of competition in the country is concerned. Uh, now I would uh, move on and would like to invite uh, Advocate uh, Zameer Nathani and uh, idea, uh, he, he, he uh, basically, uh, uh, he would be covering a very important area of digital and technological market and it will be a kind of a segue into the points which have been just raised by Dr. Pandey. And um, uh, specifically, if we look at it, a lot has happened around uh, the electronic or e-commerce space, and there are multiple cases which have come up, um, whether we talk about Ola Uber or Amazon Flipkart, or even if we look at the latest WhatsApp privacy issue which is happening. So uh, over to you, uh, Advocate Zamir, about your views on this, and how do you look at it, this changing landscape? And particularly, we are talking about peace uh, with law. So how much peace you are looking at uh, being prevailed in uh, this electronic space. Over to you. Thank you. I think lawyers are blessed to have the balancing role as always between the two sides of the coin. So we are rightly placed. Uh, uh, good evening to everyone. Good morning and good afternoon wherever you are located. Dr. Pandey, Dr. Singh, distinguished co-panelists, distinguished uh, members of the institution, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, privileged to have uh, to speak at the MIT WPU. And, uh, you know, when, when we are talking today of Ola Uber case uh, and WhatsApp privacy issue, which was in the news for some time because CCI took cognizance of it, Suomoto, uh, you know, the most important part, which I remember during my study days at Harvard Business School, we were studying artificial intelligence, machine learning, and blockchain. And we were discussing whether artificial intelligence can also have biases because generally it's a feed. Now, if artificial intelligence can have a bias, that means it will get into uh, non-competitive uh, behavior or it will be against the competition. That is one of the aspects to be seen which will futuristically come to the doorstep of CCI in the next five years. The second example, when I was studying at Stanford, uh, we had visited a law firm which was also uh, patenting, you know, uh, you have Google car, etc. And you have autonomous driving, what we called, which came with Tesla. 
and you know the purpose of having that screen and autonomous driving is that so that you spend more time on your devices but while your car is driving on the way the car would also remind you that there is a coffee shop where you drink your coffee every day there is a vegetable vendor which is a supermarket which is on the way uh, and you can buy your stuff there how much of that influence will have on the competition that is the next leg which cci is also going to see in next 5 years so today while we talk about whatsapp privacy these are the two futuristic examples which are yet to see the doorsteps of cci and rightfully cci would get into it to examine how much adverse impact it has on the uh, competition which is the threshold of cci what is your appreciable adverse impact on the competition with this beginning uh, today i am going to talk about two things number one is the whatsapp privacy policy why that came into more focus is because cci took a suomoto cognizance of that and number two argument which is always put forward to cci is that that you are a competition body you know you are not a regulator of data etc uh, if data is an issue then there has to be a data privacy law there has to be a data privacy regulator why are you interfering in that business but cci has successfully and rightfully said that wherever there is an adverse impact on the competition arises out of any reason you can't prevail upon that and there is a lot of background and also judgments to support that in fact when we talk about suomoto cognizance on cci we also forget one of the most important cases of bharti airtel versus cci where in fact the supreme court of india said it's not only about suomoto it's also there is a follow on jurisdiction which cci has got all right so we are coming from a perspective and the regulator comes from a perspective that ultimately when you say that it is going to benefit the consumer and this is the argument which has been put forward why not test it before the cci so that your conscience is clear on both sides of the uh, business so this is where the starting point comes from on the side of whatsapp privacy uh, this was most debatable example because cci naturally took a slow moto cognizance because whatsapp says here is a new privacy policy either take it or leave it now everybody uses whatsapp and therefore everybody had to accept that because you can't leave whatsapp today because it's become one of your lifeline uh now when this alleged abuse of dominance issue happened with respect to the new privacy policy uh cci held that you know it will not delve into privacy concerns as they fall into the purview of different legislation dealing with information technology however cci exhibited that there has been a significant shift in perspective by acknowledging that privacy can take form of a non price competition it's not only pricing there is a non price competition also which can happen which can disrupt and be become make a company a monopoly company now this aspect came out in the market study which was done by cci on the telecom sector which was published on 22nd january 2021 so therefore it stated that unreasonable data collection and sharing could provide a competitive advantage to dominant players potentially resulting in abuse of dominance in cci uh, in the case of whatsapp also when we talk about cci getting into this domain it's not only cci in india it's a global movement which is happening there is a similar investigation which is also going on by german cartel against facebook for exploitative business terms with respect to collection of data and lack of choice to users in this case one of the contention of the german cartel was that facebook liable was the fact that the users were consenting to the terms and conditions of facebook to essentially conclude a contract which translates into a situation where facebook says that if you don't agree to it opt out of that particular situation and therefore facebook is mandating that particular voluntary consent on the user itself uh you know when cca was giving this argument and when amazon issue also came up before cca and you know we had a controversy of reliance amazon and uh, future group getting into the domain of uh, antitrust where there was an allegation of enforcement directorate uh, 
where the violation of foreign direct investment was alleged, uh, the CCI was very clear and it also cited the judgment saying that we are getting into this issue because the impunge order is just a prima facie order in the nature of an administrative direction, which has been given to the director general to determine uh, you know, uh, whether this is in violation of the competition law. Number two, and this was very bold step on behalf of CCI, uh, accolades to enhancing the jurisdiction, but getting into the subject matter. None of the parties had inherently challenged the jurisdiction of commission while it was investigating anti-competitive practices. Number three, CCI said very clearly, there is an absence of a sector specific regulator for e-commerce in India. Number three, none of the parties have even challenged the bona fide of the impunged order. Nobody has alleged that there is a malafide intention on the part of CCI. None of the parties have in fact made a statement that Wednesbury principle of unreasonable, uh, it is against the Wednesbury principle of unreasonable. What is Wednesbury principle of unreasonable? There can be two situations of unreasonableness and CCI may choose one of them and take a decision saying that, you know, this looks to be very unreasonable. And of course, WhatsApp privacy policy at that time became controversial to that extent. In Bharti et al. judgment, the Supreme Court itself has cautioned the high courts against interfering against CCI prima facie orders. So that's where the boldness of CCI comes. And in fact, CCI also went ahead and made an argument that, you know, when we did a due analysis of Flipkart, Amazon, etc., we actually found instances of vertical arrangements in the nature of preferred sellers and preferential listing of such sellers by Amazon and Flipkart. So therefore, at this point of time, getting into the domain where we see appreciable adverse impact on the competition is utmost necessary for CCI to get it. If you get a clean sheet, you walk out straight from it. And CCI also clarified that it's not only the only antitrust regulator which is doing that, there is a European Commission which has also initiated a probe against Amazon in 2019 for use of competitive sensitive data of sellers and its potential misuse. So this was on the side of CCI getting into the WhatsApp privacy uh, terms and conditions change and the argument which was put forward by CCI. The second aspect which comes as a regular argument is that the controversy between a specific regulator and CCI getting into that particular domain. Now, at the outset, we all know that the privacy law has still not been formed. India does not have a specific regulatory body such as data protection regulatory body or e-commerce regulatory body. However, there is a landmark judgment of Supreme Court of India in CCI versus Bharti Atal in 2019. The the Supreme Court of India has clarified that, you know, for maintaining committee between regulators, CCI essentially will have a follow on jurisdiction to a sectoral regulator who will first exercise primary jurisdiction to address technical issues, which is related to the case. So the Supreme Court has clarified that today you may have a sector specific regulator like data privacy regulator or not. CCI still has a follow on jurisdiction because it is looking out for any behavior which is against the competition and therefore follow on jurisdiction and powers are also given to CCI by Supreme Court of India. Now, when we talk about an Indian scenario and we talk about scenarios which look to be that, you know, CCI is expanding its domain, etc. We have a similar movement which is also going in United States. In United States, there was a house bill which says that break up Amazon and other big tech companies. Now, as Dr. Pandey pointed out, the whole issue, if you see all mergers between Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, which is happening, they are basically from the perspective of data. You may have public relations, you may have newspaper announcing much of the details, but there is a data which is one of the critical parts of these companies getting into joint ventures or mergers and acquisition. Uh, there was a proposal in United States that we should bring a law, which is known as Ending Platform Monopolies Act, which seeks to require structural separation of Amazon and other big tech companies to break up their business. 
it would make it unlawful for a covered online platform to own a business that utilizes covered platform for sale or provision of products or sale of services the platform company also couldn't own businesses to create conflict of interest such as by creating incentive and ability for the platform to advantage its own product over competitors we see continuously on the e-commerce platform if you have a successful product which is happening suddenly you find that this particular e-commerce is also providing that particular product to you which means it is using some amount of data and it is trying to have its product over the competitor there is also a moment in european commission in 2020 it published a proposal that there should be a digital services act and a digital market act which would basically mean that there should be an far reaching regulation to remedy the market power of the data rich firms like amazon google facebook and apple which is referred as gafa in european union these regulations explicitly refer big data as a source of market power and propose rules that intervalia would prevent firms from making use of data resources for specific competitive situation in addition data sharing obligations would require firms to provide access to their data resources in order to spur innovation and improve market transparency because we talk about innovations and market transparency let's utilize the data in the best form of competition now when you see this situation which is happening in india in united states and european union now from the recent development it is quite clear that there is a growing realization which is happening at a market regulator at a government level that there are unique market practices of big tech conglomerates like amazon which is affecting competition not only competitor competition regulators like cci in india or the ec in european country or the ftc in united states but also in the policy makers in national governments which may lead to regulatory and even legislative steps now overall from an india perspective i would like to just summarize cci through a series of cases has made it clear that wherever it sees any unfair privacy policies wherever it sees predatory pricing wherever it sees any anti competitive agreements or any sort of price or non price competition of dominant entities if an allegation as to an abuse of dominant position is made but a fine line needs to be drawn between determining the legal validity of such activity and subsequent competition law analysis of the potential adverse impact on competition that's where the position of cca stands and i think cca is rightfully getting into the door that's from my side thank you very much that's great abhijit uh, ji i think uh, you have covered a beautiful uh, such a elaborate topic because i believe this is a topic which uh, can go for hours you know there are so many dimensions to it and you beautifully summed up uh, and all those aspects you brought up and definitely many a times you know Uh, when we look at the competition space we focus on price competition we forget the non price uh, issues because majority of the problem is there in the non price issue which is not quantifiable and there is a challenge in bringing up the quantifiability to that so uh, i believe that is an area which requires a lot of work and definitely yes you you made uh, points very well and i'm looking forward that we have more time so that we can entertain some questions and you you can answer them but let me move forward and uh, um, uh, invite our another speaker guest speaker advocate uh, victor ayalde and he comes from a uh, partner advocate in colombia and uh, we would like to hear from you uh, advocate victor uh, your views uh, as to the changing dimension of uh, competition landscape uh, from your jurisdiction over to you Thank you very much and good morning to everyone. Uh, so glad there's so many of you joining us for this conference. Um from our side, I would like to start with a a, a view that takes us about 30,000 feet above the air to see what's going on. I would like to start by addressing what is the public policy objective? What's the public policy purpose? of having this competition law and of digital economy regulations because they come into play 
This is very important because in many jurisdictions, we are starting to see a very interesting interplay between competition law, consumer protection, and privacy law. The rise of digital platforms has brought a new challenges for states. Basically, all our regulations, all our thoughts, all our ideas were based on power and territory of each state. What happens here is that when you have digital economy, those barriers or those traditional frontiers become very blurry. And we see a new way of interaction of international law and private law and local law. And competition law is right in the middle of it. As it was said in the video and in the introduction, what is very interesting about competition law, about markets law, is that it bases its, its analysis on markets. And essentially, after we have decided to become a globalized economy from the 1990s, markets have grown and have surpassed traditional frontiers in each of these countries. So actually, competition law has been addressing these issues and these concerns before the rise of digital platforms and digital economy because we have, for example, the effects theory, that it doesn't matter where you're located in the world, if your conduct is having an effect on a, on a market, you can be subject. And we saw this in the Lysine cartel in the 1990s, where executives around the world were subject to the rules and regulations of United States antitrust law. So this is something that is not new for competition law, but it's definitely new for regulations and traditional law. This is important because when we are addressing digital economy, we might be tempted to focus on the tensions that the market is, is being created regarding traditional power of the states. When you review all the concerns going around copyright and digital economy, blockchain, finance, ride hailing, uh, all these platforms, what is very equal in all of these jurisdictions as a debate is the center of the power of how we are methodically always thinking that it's a national regulation, that it's a state regulation, and that this is not a globalized economy. What this might happen is that this might end up hindering competition or affecting one of the main purposes of competition law, which is innovation. For many years, there was a debate, and I'm talking about re the first rise of antitrust law in the United States. Companies were judged simply because they were big. They were inherently bad because they were big. This debate was surpassed, and this was it has evolved because the Chicago School of Economics was able to provide that not every market should have many companies. Not every market is built to have a lot of, 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 of participants in the market, but rather competition law goals, which is efficiency, consumer welfare, and innovation, which actually is a, is a goal that is shared with IP law, that is to promote innovation, because there's uh, incentives for new entrants, for new people to come and invent because they can achieve that competitive position that is right now being held by others is one of the main goals. This is something that was emphasized by Schopenhauer when the antitrust laws in the United States were celebrating their 100th anniversary. It's something that was, has not been part of the analysis for a long time. Now, what happens with this? That given that from the company's perspective, any judgment, any regulation, any decision is affecting their economics and the models, you have to be very careful, not only from the competition side, but also from consumer protection and privacy. Because although we do want to be able to assess some concerns, and I think that privacy concerns are valid, I think consumer protection concerns are valid, we should not be addressing these problems with traditional tools, 
because if we apply traditional tools to these problems, we might end up creating barriers to entry the market. <clears throat> Companies around the world always are, are complaining that it's very costly to comply with privacy regulations, that consumer protections do not reflect the reality of the market, and that sometimes they can create negative incentives, so there's abuses by consumers. One of the speakers before me was explaining that states have a lot of tools here. They can choose for no regulation, for deregulation, for self-regulation, and those all are valid tools. But again, market is the main force behind these companies. We are seeing a change in the discourse and in the speech of these companies, where they are seeing privacy not as a regulation, but as a competitive advantage. Many of you have been able to see now that these companies are seeing that privacy is important for consumers, and they will address privacy and they will become companies that respect privacy following privacy by design and privacy by default principles because it's good for them in the market because the market requests them it, it demands from them that they are complying with these regulations that's competitive pressure that's competition not working that's the market's free offer and free demand interacting and working properly. What the state cannot do is that by trying to address these issues without acknowledging that this is an international problem that requires international view and assessing the effects that their decisions may have on these markets is something that is a mistake. Many years ago, the Competition Commission of Singapore was analyzing a case that has been tried in many jurisdictions, which is the interchange fees of the credit cards and debit cards for Visa and MasterCard. When the Competition Commission of Singapore was assessing this problem, they came very clearly to the conclusion that financial markets and even more payment markets were very interconnected and that the decisions they made regarding the analysis of the vertical agreement of visa fixing the interchange fees in Singapore will have effects in these global financial markets. And they decided to take a very conservative approach to the problem, which differentiates from the solutions that had come in the United States where they were ruled that these change, this change fees were anti-competitive, that they could be seen as price fixing in Europe, where they were saying that they, were, they could be considered excessive. And as you go on, you see that they took a very conservative approach and say, I am realizing and I am acknowledging that from my point of view, I might not have the full information to be able to take a decision. And if I take a decision, I don't know if I might end up having an anti-competitive effect or a pro-competitive effect because the counter scenario or the counterfactual of this is that if there was no direct price fixing from Visa and Master International, the effects will be worse because bilateral negotiations would allow and create incentives for abuse of power in the market but those banks who have a larger size and a larger size of transactions and they could actually hinder competition and affect competition and exclude small banks from these markets so they were saying i don't have the full information as, as it seems this is the best scenario right now and i'm gonna refrain from doing any regulation or adopting any remedies regarding this proposed transaction and that was how, how it was analyzed this is an important lesson because when you see the economic and the basis of the economic model of free competition, of having a globalized economy, we are demanding that companies assume and have an important role to play regarding their stakeholders. Competition law, as you were saying, is very important for peace, 
and is very important in the relations with the stakeholders. Companies who do not comply with competition law will have problems in their negotiation of the relation with their suppliers, with their clients, with their competitors, because they're not going to be seen as fair players in the market. Companies have a very important role in being able to transmit value around the chain. And that value has to be true. That has to be good value. If they have obtained this value through anti-competitive practices, they have been deceiving not only these stakeholders and unduly appropriating of, of their revenues or of their share of what or, or, or their value, but also their shareholders. We're seeing that consumers will definitely not like companies who are not following these principles. And therefore, competition authorities need to assess whether the remedies are on the first hand trying to hinder or promote the nature of these markets. In digital markets, and this is a conclusion that all the digital studies conducted by authorities have come to, dynamics are faster, are fast changing. We're seeing now that what happened 10 years ago is not the same picture as five years ago or even three years ago. Therefore, the model on how we intervene in these markets needs innovation. And each state and each competition authority needs to have some introspective of seeing if they should also innovate in their way they are proposing remedies, conducting investigation, or addressing competition issues. Because traditional remedies may be attempting against not only the nature of digital markets, but also the economic model we have all said that is the best one we have. This is a, an economic conclusion. A competition is the best model we have found so far for the efficient allocation of resources. There are other economic models, but this is the most efficient we have found. And this is why basically all countries that want to become more competitive in the, in the world economy have, have adopted internal competition regulations. Most countries now around the world have the same competition with the same principles. And competition law, which is very different from other types of law, is very similar in each country because it follows the market logic. This is economics brought into law, into the rationale to be able to decide cases. Why is this important? Because from the consumer protection and the privacy side, we're seeing that they are trying to regulate platforms and they're trying to put them more duties. And these duties and these obligations are being complied by these digital uh, platforms, which have a large size. But this cost of compliance is marginally much larger for new entrants. We are trying to control the market power of digital platforms and these big companies. But in doing so, for example, in requiring all this privacy and these um, structures and registering their databases and having compliance officers and all accountability principles are very costly. And these costs are larger marginally for small and medium enterprises and new entrants than for incumbents. So therefore, although this might be trying to control and reduce the market power of digital, economy, of digital platforms, at the end of the day, it may be hindering the incentives of new entrants to come into these markets because they're seeing two things. They're seeing heightened regulation in these markets, which had low barriers to entry naturally. And they are also seeing high that these companies that achieve a good position in this market are being prosecuted. And then this whole generation of new inventors, of, of startups, of innovators, which have a dream of building these companies, are seeing that maybe they shouldn't pursue these dreams because of all this regulation that's being enacted. And from the consumer protection side, we see that if we start creating incentives to try to protect these consumers, the costs 
of managing abuse of consumers of many of these regulations. For example, chargebacks or cool off periods because there is abuse of them. These are also creating costs that may be hindering or maybe not fostering new entrants to come into the markets. So to sum up my idea here regarding these new entrants is if you're trying to follow your enemy and in doing so, you turn, out, you turn the wall down, the fence that it was protecting you to chase it. When it comes after you, nothing will protect you. And that's what we are doing with digital platform and digital economy. We are trying to control all these market powers, but in doing so, we are not aware of the economic cost and the law and economics analysis of if this may be hindering new entrants and at the end having an opposite effect on markets, which may be protecting at the end of the day, the strong position that many of these digital platforms nowadays have. That's why we should all review if permissionless innovation, if new alternatives of regulation, if new intervention is required by competition authority regarding these markets. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. I think uh, you have really brought a very, very important dimension about the international perspective of the regulation of digital markets and the area. And beautifully said that competition, consumer, privacy, these issues are all interlinked and they cannot be segregated. You know, and new tools uh, are there and it, every tool has its own pros and cons. And you have to see which tool to utilize. And overutilization of a tool may lead to a type one or a type two error. Uh, probably that is not uh, called for in competition law enforcement. So definitely, yes. Um, uh, you know, applying the tools uh, with, with proper care and caution is very, very important. Now let me uh, move further and bring another dimension uh, to the discussion which we are having. And I think we cannot leave out the competition law enforcement's, uh, you know, ex ante regulation. So competition law is known for its ex post enforcement and ex ante regulation at the same time. Uh, now, its performance has been quite impressive when it comes to regulating combinations in India is concerned. And uh, if we look at the international scenario and international perspective, uh, it has done well as well. So if uh, to, to, to speak on this particular dimension, we have with us uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar Agarwal, a senior consultant competition law and policy with Lex in this law offices. Uh, he happens to be a good old friend uh, of ours. And we have seen him in the practice corridors. So over to you, Dr. Uh, Vijay, for uh, your insights on ex post uh, regulation of competition, ex ante regulation of competition. Please put on your mic, sir. Yes, perfect. Now it's okay. Yeah, yeah. perfect, perfect. Okay. Please go ahead. Namaste to everyone who is present here. And I am very thankful to the organizer for giving me this opportunity to speak about the competition law. I would be speaking regarding the regulatory provisions under the competition law, that is regulation of combinations. My discussion would be whether the existence of pre-notification of combinations over the decade, whether it is time for the government to reconsider that it is really essential for the market, for the growth of market. So I have analyzed this process from legislative history, starting from establishment of monopoly inquiry commissions that leads to enactment of MRTP Act, and ultimately, 
that repeal of the combination provisions. So first of them, I will tell you that the concentration of economic power under the, under the MRTP Act were tackled through amalgamation, merger, extension of establishment, takeovers, etc. Because when Monopoly Inquiry Commission was asked by the industry to give the true definition of concentration of economic power, they said it is very difficult to give the precise definition of the concentration of economic power and ultimately they have said that concentration of economic power can be tackled through amalgamation, mergers, takeovers, establishment of new. So they have suggested that it should be based on value of assets, not against the market share. And secondly, they said it must be a time bound. So on the basis of the recommendations, these provisions were introduced under MRTP Act under chapter three, section 20 to section 30. And these provisions were in vogue for more than 21 years. And during this period, even they have introduced about the restriction of shares as recommended by the structure committee. And in 1984, they have introduced chapter 3A. According to structure committee, they were of the view that restriction on share of transfer also had a effect on concentration of economic power. But in 1991, when our country went through the process of liberalization and globalization, these provisions were deleted from the MRTP Act right from 27th September 1991. The statement of objects has given many reasons for such deletions. I will say one or two, they have said that as in the beginning, Mr. Suborao has also said about the reasons for statement uh, for deleting these provisions were that these were outlived its utility. <clears throat> and approval restriction on investment has a hindrance to the speedy implementation of industrial project. So that statement and object of reasons were very important. And in 99, the government has appointed high level committee to look into whether country needs a new competition law, including margin, or the same can be done through some amendment in the existing MRTP Act. But the committee was comprised of five members, one chairman and four members. So the one chairman plus three members have given their opinion that we require a new competition law, including the combinations provisions. However, the uh, Mr. Sudhirji Mulji, they, he has descended it and said, no, we can go ahead with some amendment and there is no need for the amendment of the 
new competition law. Why I am telling so? Because there is a reason. When the chairman and three members, they have given their opinion, there is one member, Mr. Uh, PM Nariel uh, Wala, who has given a decent opinion also, where he has said that we don't require a combination provisions because in 1991, we have deleted and he has elaborated that we need not to uh, have a new combination provisions. Secondly, Dr. Rakesh Mohan has also said that it is not the time that we have to introduce the new competition law which include the combination and he said that, that the, it requires a skill more consideration and it has to be wider participation by the stakeholder and in the short period of seven months this report is not complete I am saying so that in view of the majority report, where two of them are not concurring, in spite of that, we have all these provision of the combinations under our competition law. And now we have a section five and six regulating the combinations. In combinations, the same provisions are there which were in the old MRTP Act under the shape of concentration of economic power. What are those? Combination is also based on assets value. Number two, it must be within time frame, commission has to clear the combination. Otherwise, it would be a deemed approval. I must say that commission has done a very good work, very appreciable work, which is being commendable, not in our country, but internationally also. Because whatever cases, it has come before them, they have cleared the all the combination cases uh, within the stipulated time, rather less than stipulated time, for which commission must be appreciated for the hard work which they have done. But here, I am not only question of what commission has done, it really done a good work, but here I am on a proprietary. Because first, from 1st first June 2011, these provisions were brought into and force. And right from 1st June till 30th uh, November, that is up to uh, within 126 months, commission has received more than about, uh, I will say, uh, 882 combination cases, out of which 98% cases commission has cleared within the stipulated period. And in only less than 2% cases, there seems to be a, some concern. And now, from the analysis of this, I have analyzed that the view taken by Mr. P.M. Nariwala has proved to be a true. What he has said in his report is really worth readable, which is now correct. And I will, with the permission of the moderator, like to speak few lines 
from the report dissenting note of Mr. P. M. Nariwala, which he said, I quote, in many countries whose laws we have referred to, growth has already taken place. And the anxiety is that merger amalgamation should not go so far to destroy competition. In India, the position is exactly opposite. Our companies are by and large extremely small and the tempo of merger and amalgamation has not kept pace with the need for large companies to counter the threat of competition from foreign giants abroad. We therefore need not only to permit and facilitate mergers and amalgamations, we also need to push companies in this direction. A provision for prior notification may have the opposite effect. Therefore, I am saying that for less than 2% cases, we, we really see that these provisions which were notified with effect from 1st June 2011 and now having gained the experience of more than a decade, it is the high time for the commission to again look into that and my suggestion is that because these provisions are coming as an obstacle in ease of doing the business, also the small businesses houses, if they are being merged in the larger house, they are being unnecessary burdened with the high fees which attach with the filing of the pre-notification it is up to the, from 20 lakhs to 65 lakhs of rupees. The forms which are required to be filled by these forms are very elaborate and it takes a lot of time of these companies. And while taking the assistance, they have to spend a lot of more. So after going through all these, my suggestion is that First of them, these provisions would not have been notified from 1st June and we would have waited more time. But having been so notified, it is the high time for the government to be notified these provisions at least for five years and let the business may grow and uh, it may not create some kind of a obstacle. So my, my suggestion is based on the past experience of the MRTP, where in the statement of object and reason, they have still existed the same regions by which government has deleted the provision, they are still existed and it is, it is therefore necessary for the government to think about denotifying these provisions at least for five years more. And that is what I want to convey through this message. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is very it is a pleasure here in me. And uh, you agree with me on experience. And definitely you brought the perspective from MRTP till this particular day. And definitely I also, in some way, you know, subscribe to the view that one has to look at the dissenting opinion, which has been given in the SBS Raghavan Committee report. And all the dissenting opinions, whether it is Sudhir Mulji's uh, opinion or it is uh, Rakesh Mohan's opinion or PM Narewale's opinion, I believe uh, they 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 uh, require a bit of an uh, audience uh, in context, you know. And uh, definitely your suggestion you have given. I hope this particular suggestion is uh, looked at by 
the uh, concerned persons. Now, uh, with the, without further ado, let me uh, move on with our uh, uh, speaker. Uh, and uh, last but not the least, we have Dr. Sebastian Janka and partner antitrust and competition law uh, coming from Germany. And if I may just bring to the uh, audience uh, understanding that Germany was one of the uh, jurisdictions which brought up the first kind of a cartel enforcement, if I am not wrong. And uh, it has got a great history in terms of enforcement of competition law is concerned. And a lot of jurisdiction look at the enforcement, uh, the way of enforcement, the jurisprudence from Germany. So over to you, uh, Dr. Sebastian, looking forward to hear your perspective on uh, the development in uh, antitrust laws. Over to you. Yeah. Namaste, everyone, and hello for everyone uh, outside India. Um, thank you very much. Um, special thanks to Dr. Pandey, Dr. Singh, uh, and the uh, MIT uh, WPO uh, School of Law in, in general for having me here. Uh, it's great uh, to have an international exchange, and um, it's maybe a coincidence, but a, a coincidence which says a lot uh, that it's the fourth international or the fourth um, EU um, India competition week. Uh, these uh, these very days um, where um, you know uh, both um, continents um, uh, subcontinents try to exchange ideas uh, to uh, to develop a global um, better competition law and um, that's uh, I think maybe the um, the, the first um, statement I would uh, make is to learn from each other um, uh, enable to uh, in order to enable a competition enforcers um, to have a um, yeah the same understanding what serves um, consumers uh, in particular. And having uh, prepared this panel, uh, the question um, uh, I asked myself, uh, is competition law uh, the right tool uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to help uh, uh, contributing uh, to, to world peace? And I think it's maybe not the only tool, but it certainly is, and it certainly can uh, contribute um, uh, to, to having a, a fair environment, um, to um, uh, giving chances to, to all market participants and uh, eventually also helping consumers to um, get their resources uh, allocated and getting best um, value uh, back for their money, uh, meaning in, innovative products uh, and, and also for a good price. Um, the debate in Germany is um, about beyond, obviously is ongoing. Uh, how should competition law uh, um, uh, react? What is the kind of the the, the right form of regulation. And indeed, uh, public interest grounds, that's a huge debate uh, in Germany, should um, public interest grounds be uh, something taken into consideration? Uh, we have a, a tool, for instance, a minister's uh, permit, it's called, where uh, the Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs can overrule competition um, uh, of the, the competition authority's decision for public interest grounds. Uh, such as um, um, uh, labor uh, um, interests. And uh, this debate I've uh, seen while studying in South Africa on the question of black um, economic empowerment. Is that uh, something which needs to be taken into consideration while clearing um, a merger um, by the competition um, uh, authority? And um, uh, every country maybe has its own uh, approach to this, but the, the overall goal of, uh, of fairness um, I think uh, that's uh, something which um, everyone would agree upon. Um, then again, in this um, digital environment, a lot of new um, questions arise. We heard from uh, Sania and Victor uh, already uh, touching uh, upon issues, and, but there are various other uh, issues, what we uh, call a, a VUCA world, um, uh, volatile, uh, uncertain, uh, complex, and ambiguous. I think from a consumer's perspective, um, it's more complex than it used to be indeed. Um, uh, we see um, that um, competitors are not the competitors they used to be, but there's some kind of convergence um, between industries um, where uh, automotive um, uh, um, uh, manufacturers now also are active in, in different um, digital business models uh, for transportation and, and beyond. And so um, that poses, uh, from a practitioner's point of view, new um, uh, challenges uh, to, to deal uh, with this new um, uh, environment, uh, so to speak. And uh, many questions uh, are indeed very controversial. Um, I look at uh, uh, best price clauses, uh, parity clauses, that has been widely discussed in, in Europe and in Germany, um, uh, as Dr. Singh um, mentioned. 
uh, indeed for, um, uh, for the, the, the federal cartel office, our competition authority is uh, quite a front runner in many respects, picking up cases and um, uh, um, yeah, eventually prohibiting um, uh, with, the, uh, with the help of uh, uh, courts um, uh, best price clauses. But uh, obviously there's an argument to be made that such a best price clause where um, a, a hotel, for instance, um, is uh, bound not to offer better prices than uh, on, uh, on, on a platform which uses be booking or be it another platform. Uh, there's a good argument to be made that this might be consumer friendly to know the best price, uh, only having one um, uh, one uh, um, platform. But obviously, it's not only about the consumer, it's about the competitors as well uh, to, to enable uh, open access uh, to markets for them. And uh, that's another trend uh, which we see um, Digital Markets Act uh, that has been um, touched upon uh, briefly. This is a new form of regulation, which is not even a competition law regulation. It's more a, a, a general regulation for um, so-called uh, gatekeepers, um, uh, the very big firms, um, the GAFAMs or the GAMAMs, you would have to call them now that uh, Facebook is meta. Um, uh, and and, and in, in the same way, you see um, a, a similar approach in Germany. Germany. That's um, um, uh, touching upon the ex ante regulation um, uh, you mentioned. Uh, indeed, a new form of um, um, avoidance of um, being uh, then later on in the need to um, to intervene, uh, exposed, uh, which has obviously very uh, down, very big downsides for long proceedings, uh, costly and, and, and time consuming. So uh, the approach in Germany and uh, on the European level, which is uh, about to be um, becoming uh, a law in, in Europe as well, but has been already uh, implemented in Germany uh, this year, uh, is a, a two-step procedure to, um, to first um, see which um, a company is um, of um, a paramount uh, uh, cross-border or cross-market significance, that's, uh, that's what we call it, and in the second step uh, then to prohibit certain behavior. In particular, self-preferencing. Uh, that's, I think, uh, the, the buzzword of these days. Uh, also, having um, just seen um, the European General Court's uh, judgment in Google uh, Shopping, um, where uh, this was um, um, yeah, uh, objected uh, to uh, Google's behavior to um, uh, self-preference their own vertical um, uh, services uh, when um, uh, yeah, typing in, in the search result. Uh, and, and getting the results um, for for certain uh, uh, yeah be it, uh, be it journeys be it, uh, maps or whatever um, that's that's I think a new form of, of regulation that we see um, uh, in, over, in in order uh, to um, to cope with the dynamics uh, of digital markets uh, what we have um, maybe as we're running out of time just just two thoughts from my side this. Um, Regulation, uh, um, uh, where it's needed, uh, that's that's certainly something which uh, uh, you will see in other uh, jurisdictions as well. Uh, the question is whether this always is helpful uh, or whether it's to some extent also um, hindering competition and hindering a business development of, um, let's say, um, specific uh, fields. Um, one example, what, what is discussed in, in Germany and in, in the US and beyond uh, is uh, killer acquisitions. So. Germany, for instance, and then Austria and, and others introduced um, a threshold um, uh, transaction based um, to in order to um, to be able to review transactions which uh, would normally fall under the normal merger control uh, turnover thresholds. Uh, if you buy a startup company which has a huge market potential but has not made any uh, great turnovers yet, uh, that fell under the um, the scope of the uh, the federal cartel office so far, and now. They are able to review it, and uh, there's a debate about whether you know um, this tool as such is uh, useful um, and how to cope with it. Because business models sometimes really um, aim at you know building up a small service and then being bought by the big uh, tech firms. Um, I don't know whether this is discussed in India, but uh, it certainly is something which uh, is to be watched. Um, I think that uh, as a bottom line to conclude, um, regulation should in an ideal world where uh, love and peace is all around, 
be um, not so much from uh, you know the state, but rather from um, a motivation for uh, companies. I, I recently read a very interesting book uh, by a Nobel Prize a laureate, uh, Daniel Kahneman, Behavioral Economics. Uh, it is, and he, he referred to another um, a very interesting book uh, called Nudge uh, by Richard Thaler and uh, Kess Sunstein. Um, which basically, um, uh, you might know, it deals about uh, libertarian uh, paternalism, uh, giving uh, more incentives uh, for companies uh, to, uh, to structure themselves and to, to, to be compliant. And you see that every now and then, uh, uh, in particular in, in regarding, uh, you know, awarding compliance programs, um, that uh, this might help uh, companies, you know, to better structure their, 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 their companies and to, to contribute uh, to fair competition. And, um, my thesis would be we should rather work on that. Maybe also in the context of um, sustainability, for instance, you could um, uh, have a, a shorter review period of mergers, uh, which um, contributes uh, to uh, ecologic uh, issues, which uh, you know, which are like the, the real green deals, uh, so to speak. Uh, um, you could incentivize um, uh, those mergers to happen and to make the world a little bit better and a little bit more peaceful. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Uh, I think uh, that is an option and uh, uh, it, is, it is important to you, you know, bring that particular synergy. And uh, always there needs to be like competition law has to also look at the different other players like you mentioned about startups. And I think that is a very, very important aspect. When you look at MSMEs, that is small and medium enterprises. You cannot apply same standards. And that is what Dr. Vijay was also pointing out about uh, the dissenting opinions. So different markets will have different ways of uh, applying competition laws. And that was one of the reasons I believe that we could not have a common, common thing at uh, WTO. We could not succeed to have a competition law and policy at that place. And it is more about uh, bringing in convergence through mutual understanding through platforms like ICN, OECD, and the uh, likes. So I believe uh, that is what we will start off as of now. And uh, I would, I think we have already overshot the time and there are no right, questions, sir. but still, uh, uh, I have so may I kindly interrupt with your yeah, permission? Yeah, please go ahead, yeah. Uh, yeah, so sir, with your permission and the permission of the chair, our student volunteers, few student volunteers are actually eagerly waiting to ask questions to the panel. Okay, so if wonderful. you may permit, so we are, can we have yeah. some students? Definitely, we can We can have questions. So that is what I was coming to. So if there are questions, we will be happy to, uh, you know, take the questions. Please go ahead. Yeah. Sure, sure. Thank you so much, sir. I'll first request Vanshika Gupta from School of Law at MIT World Peace University to kindly ask her question to Dr. Vijay Kumar Agarwalji. Vanshika, over to you. Uh, yes, ma'am. So, sir, how does the Competition Commission of India maintain market competition by regulating anti-competitive conduct by companies? The question is to Dr. Vijay Kumar Agarwalji. Sir, may I kindly request you to unmute yourself? Yes. Yes. Uh, Vanshika, point here is commission has a two-fold jurisdiction. One is relating to anti-competitive behavior through agreements. And second is abuse of dominance. These are the two substantive provisions through which CCI adopt the tactics to see that there is a fair competition among the industry. So section three and section four are the two provisions. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I will now request Ms. Ira Lagu from School of Law at MIT World Peace University to answer uh, and, of course, unmute herself. Ira, are you there? Can you please confirm? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Please ask your question to Advocate Victor Lemos. Yes, ma'am. Greetings to everyone present here. Thank you so much for this opportunity. So, sir, my question is, how does competition law address the anti-competitive anti agreements? Uh, okay, so from, from the digital economy or how to address uncompetitive uh, agreements, 
I think that the, the opportunities of digital economy and compliance allow now companies to be compliant by design, the new processes within the company, the algorithms to define prices, to define marketing strategies can actually be built and be built on basis of being compliant with competition principles. There is a risk, of course, uh, that the algorithms and the machines can collude, but also they can be programmed not to collude. They can be programmed not to do this. So actually what we're seeing is that the future of these different tools is not try to, of course, we need to find cartels and horizontal price fixing is one of the worst uh, conducts anybody can encourage and definitely has to be sanctioned. But we need to promote within companies and in programming to be compliant by design and be able to follow the principles of competition law. So actually I see a lot of opportunities in that field for lawyers from legal design to start working on, this, on these matters. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. May I now request Ms. Vardika Mishra from School of Law at MIT World Peace University to kindly ask a question to Advocate Zameen Nathan. Vardika, over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, sir, my question is that, uh, can you shed some light on what are the main principles of antitrust competition? So three things which you have to bear in mind. Number one is abuse of your dominance position. Number two is that, is there a cartelization? And number three is, is there a tie-in agreements between the parties, all right? So when I say about tie-in agreements, it's the example of OU and the hotels comes to your mind, the make my trip, et cetera, comes to your mind. So these are the three aspects one has to keep in mind, number one. Number two, the competition also evaluates what we call in the term as appreciable adverse impact on competition, which what is the impact is happening to what extent it is happening. So there are percentages, there are revenues, there are blockages, et cetera, et cetera. So all these embargoes are also considered. CCI, uh, one should also remember that CCI is not adverse to having a thorough competition. For example, if you are working on a particular model and your recovery of cost is to be incurred, and for that purpose, you are giving something on lease model, like for example, aircraft, et cetera, et cetera, then to recover that cost, as well as to have that proper machine maintained through a, a, a standardized party, these are all not anything which is against the competition. It is to protect that particular asset. For example, your equipment, aircrafts, uh, car leasing, etc. So CCI has really gone into the depth of the matter. Three aspects it keeps in mind, abuse of dominance position, cartelization, as well as your trying agreements appreciable adverse impact on the competition. And then there are examples to it where there are reasonable restrictions which are permitted or not permitted. That's the summary of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. May I now request Ms. Sunidhi Rathor from School of Law at MIT World Peace University to please ask a question to Dr. Sebastian Janka. Sunidhi, over to you. Uh, greetings to everyone. Thank you so much, ma'am. So, uh, sir, can you please tell us if antitrust law and competition law are same or not? It depends on the, the perspective. Probably if you ask a US lawyer, they would say it's something different in a way. But uh, competition law, uh, as we understand it in, in Europe, that's uh, antitrust law. But there's also unfair competition law, which um, rather... Um, uh, it deals with a, a certain uh, unfair behavior uh, of companies uh, trying to hinder their competitors. There is a certain overlap, but um, um, competition law in general is, is antitrust law uh, dealing with um, unilateral conduct, as we heard, um, a collusion uh, between competitors and, and mergers. Uh, whereas uh, one thing um, you should uh, always uh, have uh, bear in mind that um, who is a competitor? Um, it starts with a market definition. That's the market where parties are active and that's huge uh, huge debates uh, in every deal in every transaction you have uh, whether um, parties are competitors or not because the theory of harm for a competition authority to um, um, uh, prohibit uh, um, a merger or to um, uh, clear the deal with the certain uh, restrictions that's uh, it's ongoing and uh, <clears throat> as regards exchange of information uh, that might be uh, already um, be anti-competitive, uh, not only 
uh, colluding, agreeing, um, uh, for instance, to fix prices. Uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, the most uh, uh, outmost form of, um, uh, of anti-competitive behavior, maybe, but um, also exchanging competitively sensitive information. And uh, there are many cases, uh, uh, some in which I'm uh, involved, where a debate was about um, are people, uh, are uh, companies competitors uh, or not? That's uh, you will always see. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Now, finally, we have the last question for today. I'll request Mr. Sumed Patel from School of Law at MIT World Peace University to kindly ask his question to Dr. Sanjay Pandey, sir. Sumed, over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Greetings to everyone. So as we know that competition brings forth the best in each one of us and to protect and promote this competition, antitrust laws were established. So Sanjay, I'd like to ask you, how do you think that anti antitrust laws have had an impact on the competition? Uh, Pandey, sir, may I kindly request you to unmute yourself? Thank you. Uh, this is a nice question. You have gone into the root of uh, uh, the entire program, what we are having today, <laughs> whether uh, the objective of law has been served or not. Now, uh, the whole objective of uh, antitrust or competition law is to uh, achieve uh, benefits for market and consumers. So uh, all should be happy, producers as well as consumers. Now, uh, this is slightly idealistic. Does it happen? Uh, so uh, definitely uh, difficult to answer. But uh, overall, if you look into the history of antitrust law, uh, last more than 100 years, you can look into the uh, entire world and see uh, that uh, these laws are growing. And in the last uh, decade or so, uh, you, all the panelists, they have given you account that how these laws are growing all across the world new developments are happening. Now it shows that these laws uh, called antitrust law or competition law or consumer and competition law, uh, they are serving the purpose, no doubt about it. Your, your whole idea of uh, the law serving or not, no doubt no one is going to say the law is not serving its purpose, it is. Now the extent becomes uh, uh, a varied uh, scenario and it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So uh, the majority of industry, the majority of regulator, the majority of uh, people who are uh, part of it, like uh, legal community or uh, economists or uh, policy makers, they all, and more and more they understand, definitely law will serve much more better. And that is the whole idea because uh, law is uh, ready to be used in all situations. Now, how you are going to tweak it and use it depends on the entire machinery. So uh, to answer in one sentence, definitely the law is serving its purpose. And whatever you see, innovations are happening. All The evidence is that had there been no competition, definitely innovations might have not been there. So innovations are happening. It means there is competition. Now, this cannot be a parameter that more and more innovations are happening. It means there is a great competition in the segment that we look into from sector to sector, industry to industry, that we can uh, have a separate uh, thought on that. But your question is nice. Thank you for asking this question. Thank you so much, sir. That was indeed an interesting deliberation that we just had. Dear delegates, it's time for passing the resolution and I request my technical team to kindly display the resolution of plenary session three, where I'll request all the participants to actively participate. And there we have the resolution. You will have a minute to vote for or against the motion. So as I simultaneously read, I request my technical team to also turn on the polling so that we can have in a minute the results displayed. We the participants of the first international symposium on law and peace hereby promise to comply with the laws in order to ensure that market remains competitive, which will result in the growth of the economy and the welfare of the citizens. We promise to adhere to the rules of the Competition Act and to create its proper awareness. And I request 
all the participants, the delegates, to please vote in this poll. And there are a few seconds left before we display the results of the polling on resolution of plenary session three of the first ISLP. I'm sure uh, we will have something very interesting coming forth. And uh, very soon we will display the results of the resolution that is being passed after which we have the oath by our student coordinator. Excellent. We have 100% of our delegates, dignitaries, participants, and panelists voting for the motion. Let's have a huge round of applause for this particular initiative. Thanks, thanks indeed. And now I kindly request Ms. Yashvi Goel, student from School of Law at MIT World Peace University to read the oath of the first international symposium on law and peace. I also request my technical team to have it for her. Yashvi, over to you. <laughs> On the platform of MIT WPU's International Symposium of Law and Peace, we, the sons and the daughters of Mother Earth, being the global citizens, assured by, by the duties and responsibilities of an ideal citizen, and hereby affirm that we will endeavor to promote peace and harmony through the lens of law in the pursuit of justice. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, this indeed gets us close to the conclusion of this session. May I now kindly request Dr. Varsha Nerlekar, Assistant Head of School Management, PG at MIT World Peace University, to kindly give the concluding remarks and propose the vote of thanks for today. Ma'am, over to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Puranima, ma'am. Uh, good evening to all the panelists and uh, to the guests for the day. Uh, on behalf of MIT World Peace University, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to the guest speakers and the panel members for sharing their thoughts in the International Symposium of Law and Peace. Uh, sir, your thoughts, uh, thought-provoking address has surely added a lot of value to the participants' learning experience. I also thank uh, Dean Ana Anuradha Parashar, ma'am, and the organizers for the event for hosting such a wonderful event. And uh, last but not the least, the students who had uh, shown excellent participant and had, uh, asked the questions, uh, like these, these questions really uh, were very uh, insightful, which had further uh, thrown more light on the topics. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, wish you a good day ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. In fact, I would really like to thank our Dean Professor, Dr. Anuradha Parasar, our uh, welcome address speaker, Professor Dr. Srinivas Subarao, sir. Of course, the one who just proposed the vote of thanks, Dr. Varshan Nirlekar, ma'am, for their kind presence. And definitely, before concluding the session, I would like to make an important announcement. Dear delegates, we are about to witness the next most important session, session four of day two of the first ISLB, which is you to you connect on unlocking fake news by regulation. It is my honor and privilege to mention that we will be joined by all the student participants who will definitely enlighten us on a very significant topic. We'll be joined by Ms. Behenaz Nanavati, who is a student coordinator from MIT World Peace University. We have Ms. Chaturi from Sri Lanka, Colombo Law School. We have Ms. Ovia from Seychelles, who is MIT representative again. We have Mr. Shevi Devonish from the State Council Attorney General Chambers and Ministry of Legal Affairs of Guana and Cooperative Republic of Guana. And we have Ms. Nandini Ravishankar, School of Law, MIT World Peace University student representative from Pune Bharat. So uh, very soon at 7 p.m. IST sharp, we will have you to you connect unlocking fake news by regulation. I request all the attendees, the participants to stay tuned because in less than half an hour, we are about to begin the next session. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the panelists, delegates for having such an interesting session. And thank you, Audit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank I you, Dean. Thank now, you, Dr. Bakshi, and thank you, technical team. Thank you, my co-panelists. Thank you so thank much, you. sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. You, With the permission of the moderator and the chair, I would now like to conclude the session. Thank you once again. Take care. Stay safe.
Thank you. Thank you.
The path towards attainment of peace is always full of hurdles. However, legal deliberations can act as an important scaffolding for the construction of a peaceful culture. The legal fraternity is envisioned to be the harbinger of hope that will lead human beings towards harmony. Law indeed is the means to attain the ultimate goal of peace through amicable dispute settlement and therefore this international symposium has been incepted to herald law to promote peace. The first international symposium on law and peace which is organized by MIT WPU School of Law aims to become one of the brightest beacons to herald peace and harmony through the lens of the law. The ISLP strives to provide a common platform to legal professionals, youth, policy planners, thinkers and global society at large where they can come together for dialogue, open discussions, deliberations and can use the platform to recommend measures to address conflict resolution through peace building processes to promote the culture of peace and harmony for a digitally dynamic and complex society the main mission of arranging the symposium on law and peace is to promote peace and harmony in global society through law making processes and policy decisions by imbibing the principles of justice equity and good conscience sensitizing budding legal professionals as conflict resolution ambassadors to initiate dialogue between lawyers judges policy makers jurists academicians the youth society and industry about legal dimensions and peace perspectives law is there for us when we are there with the law let's make the best out of this golden opportunity welcome to the first international symposium on law and peace The path towards attainment of peace is always full of hurdles. However, legal deliberations can act as an important scaffolding for the construction of a peaceful culture. The legal fraternity is envisioned to be the harbinger of hope that will lead human beings towards harmony. Law indeed is the means to attain the ultimate goal of peace through amicable dispute settlement and therefore this international symposium has been incepted to herald law to promote peace. The first international symposium on law and peace which is organized by MIT WPU School of Law aims to become one of the brightest beacons to herald peace and harmony through the lens of the law. The ISLP strives to provide a common platform to legal professionals, youth, policy planners, thinkers and global society at large where they can come together for dialogue, open discussions, deliberations and can use the platform to recommend measures to address conflict resolution through peace building processes to promote the culture of peace and harmony for a digitally dynamic and complex society the main mission of arranging the symposium on law and peace is to promote peace and harmony in global society through law making processes and policy decisions by imbibing the principles of justice equity and good conscience sensitizing budding legal professionals as conflict resolution ambassadors to initiate dialogue between lawyers judges policy makers jurists academicians the youth society and industry about legal dimensions and peace perspectives law is there for us when we are there with the law let's make the best out of this golden opportunity welcome to the first international symposium on law and peace the path towards attainment of peace is always full of hurdles however legal deliberations can act as an important scaffolding for the construction of a peaceful culture The legal fraternity is envisioned to be the harbinger of hope that will lead human beings towards harmony. Law indeed is the means to attain the ultimate goal of peace through amicable dispute settlement and therefore this international symposium has been incepted to herald law to promote peace. 
the first international symposium on law and peace which is organized by MIT WPU School of Law aims to become one of the brightest beacons to herald peace and harmony through the lens of the law. The ISLP strives to provide a common platform to legal professionals, youth, policy planners, thinkers and global society at large where they can come together for dialogue, open discussions, deliberations and can use the platform to recommend measures to address conflict resolution through peace building processes to promote the culture of peace and harmony for a digitally dynamic and complex society the main mission of arranging the symposium on law and peace is to promote peace and harmony in global society through law making processes and policy decisions by imbibing the principles of justice equity and good conscience sensitizing budding legal professionals as conflict resolution ambassadors to initiate dialogue between lawyers judges policy makers jurists academicians the youth society and industry about legal dimensions and peace perspectives law is there for us when we are there with the law let's make the best out of this golden opportunity welcome to the first international symposium on law and peace The path towards attainment of peace is always full of hurdles however legal deliberations can act as an important scaffolding for the construction of a peaceful culture The legal fraternity is envisioned to be the harbinger of hope that will lead human beings towards harmony. Law indeed is the means to attain the ultimate goal of peace through amicable dispute settlement and therefore this international symposium has been incepted to herald law to promote peace. The first international symposium on law and peace which is organized by MIT WPU School of Law aims to become one of the brightest beacons to herald peace and harmony through the lens of the law. The ISLP strives to provide a common platform to legal professionals, youth, policy planners, thinkers and global society at large where they can come together for dialogue, open discussions, deliberations and can use the platform to recommend measures to address conflict resolution through peace building processes to promote the culture of peace and harmony for a digitally dynamic and complex society the main mission of arranging the symposium on law and peace is to promote peace and harmony in global society through law making processes and policy decisions by imbibing the principles of justice equity and good conscience sensitizing budding legal professionals as conflict resolution ambassadors to initiate dialogue between lawyers judges policy makers jurists academicians the youth society and industry about legal dimensions and peace perspectives law is there for us when we are there with the law let's make the best out of this golden opportunity welcome to the first international symposium on law and peace the path towards attainment of peace is always full of hurdles however legal deliberations can act as an important scaffolding for the construction of a peaceful culture The legal fraternity is envisioned to be the harbinger of hope that will lead human beings towards harmony. Law indeed is the means to attain the ultimate goal of peace through amicable dispute settlement and therefore this international symposium has been incepted to herald law to promote peace. The first international symposium on law and peace which is organized by MIT WPU School of Law aims to become one of the brightest beacons to herald peace and harmony through the lens of the law. The ISLP strives to provide a common platform to legal professionals, youth, policy planners, thinkers and global society at large where they can come together for dialogue, open discussions, deliberations and can use the platform to recommend measures to address conflict resolution 
through peace building processes to promote the culture of peace and harmony for a digitally dynamic and complex society. The main mission of arranging the symposium on law and peace is to promote peace and harmony in global society through law making processes and policy decisions by imbibing the principles of justice, equity and good conscience, sensitizing budding legal professionals as conflict resolution ambassadors, to initiate dialogue between lawyers, judges, policy makers, jurists, academicians, the youth, society and industry about legal dimensions and peace perspectives. Law is there for us when we are there with the law. Let's make the best out of this golden opportunity. Welcome to the first international symposium on law and peace. The path towards attainment of peace is always full of hurdles. However, legal deliberations can act as an important scaffolding for the construction of a peaceful culture. The legal fraternity is envisioned to be the harbinger of hope that will lead human beings towards harmony. Law indeed is the means to attain the ultimate goal of peace through amicable dispute settlement and therefore this international symposium has been incepted to herald law to promote peace. The first international symposium on law and peace, which is organized by MIT WPU School of Law, aims to become one of the brightest beacons to herald peace and harmony through the lens of the law. The ISLP strives to provide a common platform to legal professionals, youth, policy planners, thinkers and global society at large, where they can come together for dialogue, open discussions, deliberations and can use the platform to recommend measures to address conflict resolution through peace building processes to promote the culture of peace and harmony for a digitally dynamic and complex society. The main mission of arranging the symposium on law and peace is to promote peace and harmony in global society through law making processes and policy decisions by imbibing the principles of justice, equity and good conscience sensitizing budding legal professionals as conflict resolution ambassadors, to initiate dialogue between lawyers, judges, policy makers, jurists, academicians, the youth, society and industry about legal dimensions and peace perspectives. Law is there for us when we are there with the law. Let's make the best out of this golden opportunity. Welcome to the first international symposium on law and peace. The path towards attainment of peace is always full of hurdles. However, legal deliberations can act as an important scaffolding for the construction of a peaceful culture. The legal fraternity is envisioned to be the harbinger of hope that will lead human beings towards harmony. Law indeed is the means to attain the ultimate goal of peace through amicable dispute settlement and therefore this international symposium has been incepted to herald law to promote peace. The first international symposium on law and peace which is organized by MIT WPU School of Law aims to become one of the brightest beacons to herald peace and harmony through the lens of the law. The ISLP strives to provide a common platform to legal professionals, youth, policy planners, thinkers and global society at large where they can come together for dialogue, open discussions, deliberations and can use the platform to recommend measures to address conflict resolution through peace building processes to promote the culture of peace and harmony for a digitally dynamic and complex society. The main mission of arranging the symposium on law and peace is to promote peace and harmony in global society through law making processes and policy decisions by imbibing the principles of justice, equity and good conscience, sensitizing budding legal professionals as conflict resolution ambassadors, to initiate dialogue between lawyers judges, policy makers, 
jurists, academicians, the youth, society and industry about legal dimensions and peace perspectives. Law is there for us when we are there with the law. Let's make the best out of this golden opportunity. Welcome to the first international symposium on law and peace. A very warm welcome to one and all present here. It has always been the tradition of MIT World Peace University to start the session with a world peace prayer, a prayer which enchants peace. Let's all join hands and close our eyes and seek the blessings of the Almighty. I request my technical team to kindly relay the world peace prayer. जय जय स्वसंवेद्या आत्मरूपा देवातूति गणेशु सकलार्थ मति प्रकाशु मने निरुत्ति दासु अवधारि गुदी गुरु ब्रह्मा गुरु विष्णु गुरु देव महेश्वर गुरु साक्षात पर ब्रह्मा तस्मै श्री गुरवे नमः ओम पूर्णमद पूर्णमिद पूर्णात् पूर्णमुदच्यते पूर्णस्य पूर्णमादाय पूर्णमेवावशिष्यते ओम शांति 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 नमस्ते टू वन एंड ऑल प्रेजेंट हियर आई संकीर्तना कवलुरु ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ डॉक्टर विश्वनाथ कराड एमआईटी वर्ल्ड पीस यूनिवर्सिटी welcome you all for the first international symposium on law and peace dear delegates it's my honor to share this prestigious platform of the first international law Symposi uh, symposium on law and peace with all of you who have connected with us from all across the globe in this most awaited fourth session of youth to youth connect we will be hearing from experienced persons from legal field and students studying law from all across the globe who are present with us to share their thoughts views and experiences on a very burning topic unlocking fake news by regulations my dear friends it's now time to meet our speakers for today's session i'm glad to have the moderator for today's session who is benaz nanavati a third year bba llb student from mit world peace university who not only topped the charts of her batch but also partakes in extracurricular works towards her community to which she gives the utmost importance behnas distinguished herself as a conscientious and energetic pioneer in the fields of leadership and management through organizing various events on social media as well as in the local centers she exceeds not only in the field of law but also she has great sportsmanship behnas is an active member of red cross society and contributes her time and energy to the upliftment of underprivileged members of the society now let's move to the first speaker of this session we are extremely privileged to have with us ms vernacula chaturi mendes 
She is from Sri Lanka, who is currently practicing as attorney for law for seven years in superior courts and original courts of Sri Lanka since she was admitted to bar in December 2010. Her area of practice extends from civil law to constitutional law. She completed her master's in law with degree in law degree with O grade and securing third rank in merit list in Savitri Bai University of Pune, Bharat in 2019. Hearty welcome, ma'am. Now let's move to the second speaker of today's session. We are very happy to have Ms. Ovia. Ms. Ovia, she is a student from MIT World PC University who is currently studying first year in her BBA LLB honors. She has participated in few public speaking and karate competitions. She has always been, of, been in, interested in the field of law as this subject requires mastering in one's communication skills as well as the field the, which can help people. Welcome, Ovia. The third speaker for today's session is Mr. Chevy Antonio Devanish. We are very honored and privileged to have you, sir. Uh, he is an attorney at law employed as state counsel at the Attorney General's Chamber and Ministry of Law of Guyana, where he also functions as the Ministry License to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Parliamentary Affairs and Governance. He is also a former lecturer of constitutional law, administrative law, public law, political theory in Caribbean politics of University of Guyana. He also holds a certificate in advanced public international law from University of West Indies, Mona. A very warm welcome, sir. We are delighted to have Ms. Nandini Ravishankar, a student of first year BBA LLB honors at MIT World PC University in School of Law. Being an avid reader, she looks forward to take the rich legacy of law forward to many generations. She developed immense interest in the field of oration, one of them being the participant in MRPI Forum on Free in Enterprise Elocution Competition and Mani Bhavan Gandhi Smarak Nidhi in Mumbai. A very warm welcome, Nidhi. Moving ahead, I call upon Mr. Amay, a third year BBA LLB student, to give the welcome address. Over to you, Amay. Thank you, Sankirtana. Good evening to one and all present here. I'm extremely, extremely honored to give the welcome address for this session. I really look forward to listen from all our guest speakers for this session on unlocking fake news regulations. Law and peace, although considered to be separate and in fact two sides of the same coin, peace is the ideal for which law and the tool to make it achievable. If on the one hand laws like IPC commands punishment for wrong, then on the other hand laws like fundamental rights message of a peaceful country and society which are free and equal to all. Law and peace are where all always be working together to promote democracy, equality, humanity and all together in this world. On that note, I am a, from third year BBA LLB, welcome everyone on the MIT World Peace University first ever international symposium on law and peace. Thank you. Thank you very much for the welcome address, Amai. Now, I request all the members in the panel to turn on their cameras and put a beautiful smile on their face so that we can capture this beautiful moment through a screenshot. I request my technical team to please capture the moment. Thank you so much. Now, I formally hand over the dice to our moderator, Ms. Behenaz Nanavati, to take over today's session. Benas, over to you. Thank you, Ms. Sangeetna. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, students and faculty members. I'm Benas Nanavati, and it is an honor and a privilege to be a moderator for the session Unlocking Fake News by Regulation. The advent of the 21st century and the internet has made communication faster than ever before. However, this has also led to the circulation of fake news like never before. We all saw during the pandemic how the government had to deal with fake news about COVID with WhatsApp and other social media platforms being the major contributors. In today's day and age, it's more than important that regulation controls fake news while at the same time not becoming a burden on our freedom of speech and expression.
I request the participants to kindly note down their questions and post it in the chat box as the time passes by. I would like to also request our speakers to keep to time. We request our technical team to play the session with you. Fake news generally refers to journalistic articles that intentionally or unintentionally confirm false or inaccurate information. False information can spread like wildfire without counteracting the investigation and fact-checking that journalists traditionally carry out. Often written with an emotional appeal, to be disseminated based on vitality rather than truthfulness, and there are clear financial incentives to maximize the production and distribution of this information. And this is one of the key challenges of our time. Misinformation erodes trust in institutions and undermines democratic processes. In an online world of misinformation, trust is a powerful weapon for retaining audiences and advertisers and standing apart from the noise. This session will shed light upon this phenomena of unlocking fake news by regulation that will briefly give an insight on the importance of this issue as it is not just a technical problem, but also a social and economic one. Fake news generally refers to journalistic articles that intentionally or... Thank you, to the technical team. Firstly, I would like to briefly introduce to you our guest speaker, Ms. Varnakula Chaturi Mendes Vikram Manayaka. Over to you, ma'am. Varnakula, you need to unmute your mic. Sorry. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. And first of all, I thank for inviting me for this international symposium on law and peace. And also I appreciate for select selecting timely needed topic, which is uh, unlocking fake news by regulation for this youth to youth session. Actually today, peace of the society is threatened by the youth while they are enjoying their right through several activities. And as finally, law has to interfere or involve, control the conflict by imposing several regulation. Then we move for our today topic for the fake news that we unlocking fake news by the regulation. What is fake news? Generally, it can be identified as news or any information itself is fabricated with no verifiable facts or sources and mainly intentional design to mislead the reader. It may be targeted, finally it may be targeted or target to sensitive minority of the society. Before I talk about the fake news, we should know about from where it come from. It's directly come from while we are exercising our freedom of speech and expression. So we cannot talk about the fake news without concerning the basic fundamental right of the speech and expression. So uh, as we know, since inception of human society, man has always had the demand of social communication. Then because of that, the very first session of United Nations Assembly in 1946, right to speech and expression has become a fundamental right. And after that, several international covenant has confirmed it, uh, especially ICCPR also. And also the right to speech and expression is identified as a thornstone of other fundamental rights, which are enshrined under the uh, human rights, declaration of the human rights. Uh, for this, this, this discussion, I mainly focus on Sri Lankan legal perspectives. Uh, as a member of the United Nations, Sri Lanka also 1978, 
by uh, passing constitution of a democratic socialist of republic of sri lanka accepted right to speech and expression through article 14 but this article 14 sub clause 2 indicates such uh, some uh, indicate that such speech and expression can be restricted and also subject to any restriction as may be prescribed by the law because of the mainly for the interest of uh, national security and the public health morality and interest of the regional and religious harmony also incitement to an offense and also article 15 sub clause 7 again restricted freedom of speech and uh, expression for the purpose of the national security i think similar uh, uh, guidelines are already in, imposed in the uh, indian constitution to article 19 so these all fundamental restrictions shows that freedom of expression cannot be entertained as an absolute right so main uh, rational of these restriction is not to prohibit fundamental right of the speech and expression but to maintain the peace and uh, communal harmony today by one clicking as we know because of the advancement of the technology by one clicking any news whether it is its content is true or false uh, now spread like wildfire every corner of the country without concerning how it affect to the entire society especially today several social uh, platform actually networks are used as a platform for the purpose of sharing fake news uh, so we can say uh, as i mentioned before about co constitution barriers of the Sri Lankan constitution uh, imposed uh, on freedom of speech and expression directly stand against also for the spreading fake news as it has been entertained part of uh, speech and expression for the purpose of secure the peace and harmony of the society. In addition to the constitutional barriers, we can see through the section 120 of the penal code of Sri Lanka, uh, mainly uh, penalize the fake or false information sharing by any uh, anyone making or making any excite among the society or make a part to the public disquiet. Uh, today, mainly these fake news create, we know today these uh, fake news create a religious or ethnic disharmony. Uh, actually, new uh, situation, what is the new situation in Sri Lanka? we face some unfortunate situation uh, incidents in 2019 it is a uh, uh, known to everyone because the thing is a uh, uh, because of that new false uh, news bill is being processed by the minister of justice especially uh, against the backdrop of the easter sunday uh, massacre i think everyone know uh, armed group bombed uh, three catholic churches and uh, three hotels uh, destroying three hotels and also claiming 120 lives because of these uh, after these incidents uh, following these uh, bombing there was an uh, eruption of anti muslims violence with the uh, mobbing uh, started started targeting these uh, minority people who are uh, supposed to engage these things actually mainly uh, it convert the country to a very unpleasant situation because I was a witness at the, at that moment because I was in India. I could not contact my family also uh, as a result uh, to control the situation at that time, uh, especially uh, all the social media was uh, struck down uh, by government. So actually uh, main target of this new bill everyone has a right everyone has a right to speech and expression uh, through any media but on the other side it try to bring some responsibility of the person who share or making any news without confirming the resources and also give the i also such person should have confidence to nothing to worry after sharing it as a finally, the, these are spreading false information on the social uh, media 
or hate speech directly can cause division of the society and also create religious uh, and ethnic, uh, ethnic tension and endanger of the human uh, individuals also directly affect to the working group of the society and benefit of the country. So it, it should not be permitted actually for the uh, framework of the democracy. And there is no doubt, no debate regarding, regarding need for the regulate to curb this matter. So uh, as a first, uh, finally, I want to thank for giving this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, very much, Ms. Chaturi, for such a riveting take on the topic, imparting knowledge and updating us all on the situation and related laws and regulations in Sri Lanka. I would further like to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Ovia Veluman. Over to you, Ms. Ovia. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am honored as well as I am grateful to be given the opportunity to, to be one of the speakers today. So our topic for this session is unlocking fake news by regulation. Now let's start off by understanding fake news, what it is. And this has been, um, this definition has been given to us by the former speaker. But uh, let's just go ahead and uh, recap. Um, fake news is inaccurate information with, uh, which is often presented to the general public as news. Now, news, on the other hand, is accurate information of recent events. And these recent events could uh, be events that could have taken place in a village or a, a town, a city, the, your country, wherever you are in this world. Um, so the purpose why, uh, of this fake news is to create a sensation, to discredit individuals, and to discredit corporations, it is uh, done by individuals, a group of individuals to promote their own agendas. And these agendas can be either personal or political. Now, these purposes, they incite fear in the members of the public. This, this creates distrust in the members of the public. And such a creature forces us to carry out the undeniably unnecessary process of doing our own research to seek the truth. Now, this task is tiresome. This task should not be necessary. And lastly, honesty shouldn't be a game of hide and seek. Now, where I come from, unfortunately, um, truth journalism has been vanishing. And if I recall correctly, it was back in 2016 when a certain individual, we all know this individual, um, the 45th president of the United States of America, former President Donald Trump, he had been found on numerous occasions just exclaiming the words, fake news, this is fake news. Don't listen to that, that's fake news. Um, in Seychelles, we, 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 not, we did not use that term much before it was, um, oh, that's a rumor, don't listen to that, that's false, don't really listen to that. Nowadays, people, the use of the term fake news, it has skyrocketed. Um, so, and speaking of Seychelles, even Seychelles is no exception to fake news. The last month there had been so many fake news and one of the prominent ones was, um, <clears throat> was towards the end of November of this year. It's very, uh, very recent. Um, so in this case, suspects, the suspects were arrested in relation to an embezzlement case that had happened back in 2002. So almost uh, two decades after, people, were, who were, um, people related to that case were being arrested. And naturally, when they were being arrested, law enforcement also searched their premise. When this search uh, was going on, they found so many weapons weapons such as grenades, weapons such as uh, guns, and so many others, which I don't know the name of. <laughs> um, so this is concerning. But anyway, when this news was leaked, it was leaked and social media users, they did not remain silent. They tapped away on their keyboards and they made up the story that members who were arrested in relation to this case were part or were associated with the current opposition party 
and they were planning on enacting a coup d'etat. Now, a coup d'etat is a violent overthrow of the current government, uh, and usually it's carried out by a small group of people. Now, when this news, when this fake news got out, people automatically believed uh, they did not uh, even doubt for a second that this was false. Why did they? Why did they do that? Because, because, back in 1977, there had been a coup d'état, um, and in, it, it, this was enacted by the pre, the vice president at that time. Uh, during when the president at that time had a visit, had traveled to the UK for Commonwealth affairs. Um, he had said that the violent group of men are demanding that he should be president and to ensure the safety of the people, he accepted. Now people gobbled that up, they believed it, and those who opposed it, they were tortured and then eventually killed. Now outside sources, they, they claim that this event was bloodless, when in fact there was so much blood spilled. And um, I could personally say that I know people that ev almost everyone I know had at least two members of their family killed during that event, at least two members. So this was in fact not bloodless. So this was the, coming back to the present time, you can imagine how frightened people were especially the generation that experienced the trauma, they didn't, they don't, they, no one wants to experience that all over again. And the newer generation, most of them, they, they stayed inside. Most people, almost everyone actually, they stayed inside. They were too frightened to get out of the house because of this fake news. And the town, the town looked like a ghost town, really. Um, this was concerning and obviously the president had to do something about it. He held a conference and explained everything to the public that this was fake news, don't believe it. This was just done to inside fear. And the opposition party, now they, their reputation was also ruined because some people still doubt whether this was in fact fake news when really it was. Now let's step out of Seychelles and look at the world as a whole. During the pandemic, well, which is still ongoing, um, there had been so many vaccine politics, and this vaccine politics, the breeding ground for fake news, just as you guessed it. <laughs> and I'll read out some of the fake um, information that had been spread to the public. Some people had um, created this claim that the vaccine, in fact, contains microchip and the government is actually keeping track of them through the chip that was inserted by the vaccine. And then some people even believe that the COVID vaccines can make you infertile. Now, this was another story in which was reported by CNN, I believe. This was really crazy. The CEO of Pfizer, specifically the wife of the CEO of Pfizer, um, had died of taking such, of taking such, of taking the said vaccine. Now, the, these are all examples of um, fake news and the, the thing that was behind this, the one that spread all this was social media. Social media is a power, powerhouse in spreading fake news and it can be traced that um, these, these information were put out by influential people who have huge platform in social media. Now, there are laws in um, several countries relating to fake news, especially laws like in, in countries like in Singapore, where they have begun passing new laws that allow authorities to regulate what they deem dangerous. And there are countries where they, such laws are already in existence. And one of the criticisms of this, um, this enactment of such laws is that these government officials, authorities are abusing the, the said law and censoring true, accurate news. Now in Seychelles, there is uh, no such laws at the moment present. Um, and I would like to sum up this, uh, this speech by, say, by just going over what, we, um, what, I just went, what I just spoke about. So we know what uh, fake news is, we know its purpose, 
and uh, we know what it could do to the members of the uh, society. And just now to end this, I shall I shall state that the I shall say I I will again thank. Uh, I will again thank the people who have been who have given me the opportunity to speak today, as well as that I shall leave the spotlight on for my fellow speakers who will share more knowledge on the topic. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ode. Thank you. For setting the audience for informing us about the embezzlement scenario, which was rather astonishing to hear. Our next dynamic speaker for today is Mr. Shavi Devanish. Over to you, Mr. Shavi. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, as the case might be. Um, I am very grateful for this opportunity to speak with you and to present some of my ideas uh, on this subject matter. Um, I think that an appropriate point of departure for my contribution to this discussion is identifying workable definitions. Now, I know that some of my colleagues have um, given such definitions, but for the purpose of specific things I want to say, I'll, I'll restate the definition which I was able to glean. Uh, the Cambridge Dictionary defines fake news uh, as a false stories, which appear to be news, which is spread on social media platforms or various social platforms or even uh, in physical form, and which is created specifically for the purpose of influencing political views or which is intended as a joke, satire. Based on this definition, it's important, I think, to make a distinction between what uh, is considered to be fake news and what is merely considered to be false information, perhaps spread by uh, individuals who are influential. Quite often, um, in my experience, and I'm pretty sure that you have experienced this as well, we have come across articles which purport to be published by media houses or even in the name of reputable media houses, um, incorrectly so, which provides information which is clearly false and which has all sorts of um, negative implications or repercussions and we will examine some of those. It's in, I think it's also important to zone in on the term regulation as we're having this discussion and consideration as to what are we talking about exactly when we speak about regulation and typically we refer to either state regulation and self-regulation so the question is if there is to be regulation and i think that we can agree that there ought to be some kind of regulation should that regulation come from within the media industry or should it come from without or perhaps it is most effective to have a combined approach um, now, at the backdrop or underpinning this discussion is the intersection between freedom of speech and freedom of expression and the public interest. That is, <clears throat> is there any or are there any circumstances in which freedom of expression ought to be curtailed or limited in the interest of the public interest? And more specifically, is fake news um, a, a situation, a phenomenon which necessitates limitations or placing limitations on our free speech or our free media. Now, without a doubt, media and more importantly, a free media is indispensable uh, to a healthy democracy. And there's good reason that it's referred to as the fourth estate by political and other theorists. And it will be remembered in 2019, based on some research that I was doing, the Indian prime minister um, referred to the media as a pillar of democracy, one of the four pillars of democracy actually. And I think that these references exist for good reason. Indeed, media investigations have in the past exposed corrupt politicians and outed unscrupulous corporate stakeholders. We merely have to recall uh, various leaks of papers from various governments which implicated um, high level government functionaries in various types of uh, corrupt activities or even tax evasion in certain circumstances. Um, and states recognize this power. There are various states which control strictly uh, the content which is published by media outlets. And there are some states which do not allow any independent, in, independent media whatsoever. Um, now, media has also been used in a most dangerous way. Uh, and we zone into what we're talking about this afternoon, fake news, and what has been the implication of fake news in some circumstances. 
uh, misinformation about the 2020 US election result and that information being presented as news by various media entities in the US um, has caused widespread discontent and distrust in government. And this culminated in what has now come to be probably referred to as the Capitol riot in 2021. This was in the US in January, during um, which rioters were, uh, they, well, according to them, they said they were trying to take the Capitol back. Misinformation has also resulted in uh, massive vaccine hesitancy across the globe and contentions about the origins of the vaccine or the COVID-19 um, virus, the effects of the vaccine and the effectiveness of the vaccine. There have been various rumors concerning that and one of my colleagues gave some of the rumors which have been peddled. Now this has, results, this has resulted in the, an extension in the period of time in which COVID has ravaged uh, various countries in the world. And we believe that in the, if this fake news was not being uh, peddled and if it had not triggered the vaccine hesitancy, which we currently see, um, perhaps the extensive, the extensive period in which COVID has ravaged the world might have been avoided. In a paper titled Vaccine Hesitancy and Fake News, quasi-experimental evidence from Italy, um, the authors noted that the WHO, the World Health Organization, noted that the spread of fake news and misinformation in social media is blamed as a primary cause of vaccine hesitancy. And we have seen how vaccine hesitancy has affected uh, our various countries, Guyana included, India included, and several other jurisdictions. The same article found that fake news has resulted in reduced vaccine rates for other diseases such as measles. Now these and other occurrences um, on a large and a smaller scale continue to fuel calls for regulation of the media industry, particularly to target, uh, restrict, and mitigate fake news and its effects. But the question is, what should this regulation look like? And how far should regulation go? Proponents of media freedom and freedom of expression are always wary of state regulation because quite often when uh, the state intervenes, it is usually quite difficult to roll back the measures which are implemented. Um, increased regulation can indeed dim the lights of objective media scrutiny and it can dull the light of media operatives. Corruption and all manner of illegalities may develop and flourish in such situations. So what are some of the suggestions which are on the table? As I indicated earlier, um, there are calls for objective state intervention, um, but there are some risks where that is concerned. There are also calls for uh, independent accreditation bodies so that, for example, in order for media houses to continue to operate periodically, there may be an assessment of their performance over a particular period to determine whether their publications have been uh, injurious and whether those injurious publications um, were the subject matter or the content of those publications were a false, fake, and otherwise. There are also recommendations for incentives to be provided to media operatives for them to be encouraged to uh, continue to publish a uh, true, correct information. Um, all media houses have a responsibility to ensure that they publish information which is true and which can be relied upon, especially in light of the very important role that media plays in society. So as we have, as we continue to have this conversation on fake news and um, regulation, it's important to consider all options and in the end, uh, implement the option that will ensure that people receive true and credible information while also allowing media outlets, media establishments to continue um, doing the job, which is so critical to the, the maintenance of democratic societies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Thank you, Mr. Shabi, for such an enlightening speech. You have truly aware us on how fake news, in other words, is just a fear factor and it scares people. Moving further, I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Nandini Ravi Shankar. Over to you, Ms. Nandini. Thank you so much, Behanas. A very good evening to all eminent dignitaries who are present here on this auspicious occasion of the International Symposium of this revered university. Fake news and its unlocking is something as budding lawyers, which each and every one of us as an individual is to be aware of. What is fake news as and when 
there is an intellectual advancement and progress in the society as a whole, it's, that's when an individual understands the interests upon his effective understanding as to what is the difference between a news which is credible and which is not credible. I feel at this juncture, it would be highly appropriate for me to quote people's own editor, Mr. Paneer Selvan, when he says that, know the difference between the rose and its thorns. Every spectacular idyllic news representation in front of your eyes need not always be the factual representation. At times, the human mind subconsciously knows the presence of thorns, that is the tainted facts and evidence which are presented, but we tend to neglect it just because the intellect denies the fact. There are so many instances where politics has had a primacy over even the right to health of the people. As my fellow speaker from Sri Lanka had said, that somewhere right to information is an inalienable right of an individual. When right to information is an inalienable right, in fact, more supposedly stated as a fundamental right, why is it wrong to say that every individual has the right to a credible information as well? There are so many evidences of this, which I will be illustrating forthwith. One of them being the recent elections that happened in the North India, where the COVID cases were actually spiking, heralding this very fact as to people's carelessness that faces as a consequence. One needs to understand that when everything is written in the newspaper, a layman, India is actually bound by definitely a trust and a mutual agreement to live together, but there is a problem of illiteracy. And it is very beautiful and surprising to see the fact that it's the illiterate people who come forward. It's the illiterate people who come forward to understand the veracity, to understand the credibility, to check whether what is authentic and which is not authentic and which is to their level of understanding. And that's when we understood that the cases in Bihar that were represented to be coming down was actually tainted. It was fabricated because political supremacy had a forward seat and somewhere the right to health of the people, right to credible information of the people had a setback, which should not be the case in a democracy like India. Let me also tell you a fact that Omicron, the recent virus that is depicted to be as the variant of concern by the Honorable World Health Organization, is somewhere a dilemma in the minds of the people. And two days back, it was reported in the newspaper that international flights have been banned because it's a variant of concern and the S genome in that particular Omicron is not to be depicted. And when the S genome is not present, the interesting medical fact says of its worthy presence. Amidst all these complexities and intricacies, when the government does not give importance to the health of the people, that's when people start understanding in a pessimistic way that it's okay for them to be maskless, it's okay for them to go out not being inoculated, not understanding the importance of vaccine, and so on and so forth. You have a lot of consequences coming up, which led to the prominent second wave of COVID coming up. Apart from politics, let me also tell you a perspective what a layman keeps and what a learned man keeps. We all being law students, it's important for us, let me tell you, that N.V. Ramana, the Honorable Chief Justice of India, had taken the podium as an initiative to highlight the fact that as we, the tomorrow's youth, the future thereafter, it's important for us to participate in an innumerable number of debates. And that's how you unlock the fake news. Now, how is that possible when you have formed your very foundation on an information which is not credible? When you talk to a person who is extremely learned, that's when you try to correct a lot of facts which you have misinterpreted or misconstrued. And that's what one of this eminent organizations of MIT in its subject matters of interest promotes a lot of debates. And it's enthralling as a student for me to participate in that because somewhere in spite of me having based my foundation of a, on a source which is not extremely 100% credible or not extremely worthy to be called as not so credible, 
where's the scale of balance to let me know as to where should I correct my facts? And that's how you should participate in a lot of debates. Second, instead of pointing at a lot of authorities saying this authority should be put in place to scrutinize that this information is right, uh, this information is wrong, it's important for us as tomorrow's future generation to be well informed. It's important for us to have a vivid description of the things that are ongoing around us. It's important for us to not just rely on one particular source, but say even thousands of sources are less because every individual as beautifully depicted comes up with a different interpretation of the news, which is in India as India is a democratic country, there is always a room for deliberation, room for discussion and room for correction. Most importantly, never rely on one particular source. Never rely on one particular individual thoughts because they have the highest probability of being tainted and fabricated. Another important thing, my fellow spokesperson had once said that somewhere today, illiteracy, I think, correlates with a person's understanding as to what is credible and fake. See, we as individuals cannot actually differentiate between what is a fake news and unlocking itself, ironically, happens because of how you interpret it. And unlocking fake news is only possible when you unlock your blockage of mind as to your interpretation is wrong or your interpretation is right. Recently, regarding the vaccine of Covishield, there was a big rumor that was being uh, brought up saying that it leads to a possibility of blood clots. You see the consequence of people somewhere were extremely hesitant and were taking with a grain of salt whether to come forward and get vaccinated or not. I mean, this actually discourages the people in a wrong way. I also have uh, penned down this particular evidence in my script and it actually made me with a great huge matter of surprise that an Omicron variant or a variant like COVID, shield, uh, I mean, uh, uh, COVID, which something the entire world is being surprised with. There was a recent news that came in the newspaper like cow dung and cow urine has the greatest certainty of you uh, being protected from oh, uh, this virus. Again, that discouraged the people from taking up vaccines. And that's how, consequently, the number of cases went up. So you see the consequences of fake news and how to unlock this. Know your facts and how to know your facts through discussions and how to discuss, discuss with a person who is of, if not politically sound, but politically vivid, a descriptive mind, a mind of communication, a mind of deliberation, a mind not relying on one particular source, but a mind which is relying on the interpretation of various sources, because that's what law expects. And law is not something which disturbs peace, it should go in correlation to peace and peace can exist in the society only when we have a credible information. And I rightly prudentially with extreme respect to everyone present here would put forth the fact that a credible information is definitely a need of the society today. And without a credible information and fake news being in existence and the worst part, we not being able to differentiate between what is right, what is wrong, and if not extreme ends of the pole as to what is right and what is wrong, if we can't differentiate between what is right and partially right, we are in a much worse condition. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Nandini, for addressing us and informing us with the new laws being instated and how the government is thoroughly trying, them, trying themselves to get the public to not believe in fake news. They simply read and then forward, but instead get vaccinated and fight this fight together. As our student delegates on Youth to Youth Connect have spoken like true spokespersons on today's session being unlocking fake news by regulation, our two most important takeaways could be every post or message need not be true and should have substantive enough support to be authentic, that right to information is an inalienable right, and yes, participate in a lot of debates. You have a voice, your opinion matters, and you need to speak up and be heard. After listening to all the mesmerizing speeches given to us by our spirited and energetic young speakers, Ms. Sangeetna will now begin with the much-awaited question and answer session. Over to you, Ms. Sangeetna. 
Thank you so much, Prahnas. So all of us have heard what our speakers had to say about fake, uh, fake news. We will proceed to the uh, question and answer round. So the first question uh, that we have received in our chat box is, what should be the ambit of regulations to avoid the spread of fake news on social media? I would like Ms. R Nandini Ravishankar to answer the question. Social media handles uh, nowadays have a lot of, like we have a lot of people having access to social media handles. You really can't expect one particular person sitting there and scrutinizing innumerable number of data that is being, you know, flowed to the public arena. And that I rightly mentioned in the speech that I put forth as an illustration that when you as an individual, see, in WhatsApp, let me give you a very practical example. Two days back, I got that half turmeric in hot water, you will be away from COVID. Now, you will be receiving a lot of information as such. And that's how you as an individual has to be, see, we are all well informed as to we know how the government is struggling. We know it's literally taken us four to five months for us to come up with a vaccine. And every now and then COVID gives us a surprise of having a different variant of having a different uh, mistake in correcting its own DNA that comes up with a new variant. So when you are coming across so many misrepresented facts, which you know to be right, uh, wrong subconsciously, it's better for you to stay away from it rather than expecting a particular regulating body to sit there and govern each and every data and see, data will flow. It's how you interpret it and how sound you are in that interpretation. So I really feel that there is no particular authority, but it's not right for an authority or you claiming to be uh, asking for an authority to be there to correct the interpretation and the way you invite the information coming thereby. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Nandini, for answering this question. I hope uh, we'll all be now more aware about the fake news that's floating. So the second question a student is willing to ask is, uh, can curbing the right to freedom of speech and expression be a solution in stopping the spread of fake news and harsh rumors on social media? Uh, I would like Mr. Chevy, uh, sir, would you please answer this question? Should I repeat it, sir? No, it's quite fine. Um, actually, I don't. Th I, I do not think that that will be the solution. Um, I actually think you no. Know, a couple of my colleagues mentioned uh, several several. I think um, measures that I think which together is likely to address the issue. I think that regardless of whatever regulation we come up with, um, persons who have um, this proclivity to for spreading fake news will continue to find ways to do so. So I think that um, curbing um, freedom of information insofar as it addresses Fake news is one aspect, but I think that persons will find other avenues. Uh, so, and quite often what we find is that on Facebook and other social media um, sites, you have um, fake sites that you're unable to trace, which public, which publish fake information. And it's difficult to identify who's responsible for those publications. And so it may be difficult to target those individuals with regulations especially if there are countries um, and there are several which do not have the technology to do so. So in addition to promulgating, I think regulation or legislation to specifically target fake news by known media establishments, it's also necessary to, as uh, uh, I think it was Nandini, please forgive me if I uh, pronounce your name incorrectly, but it's important to enhance the education of your population and it's important to continue government to continue to have programs where they want to educate members of the public so they are better able to discern fake news or at least become suspicious if they see certain information and perhaps to, to fact check it. And it's also important to encourage people to read more. Um, so because I think that I'm, the more educated, well, I would like to think that the more educated you are, the less likely you are to buy into fake news. But um, we've seen some, some examples that, um, uh, that's not always the case. So I think a combination of these measures, um, not just uh, infringing or limiting uh, liberty, 
to the point where it addresses fake news, but a combination. It, it, you require that regulation, but you, in, you also require a more educated populace, and you require a populace which is encouraged and more likely to fact check whatever they read. Thank you so much, uh, sir. It was very clear, as you said, that fake news will find their way to spread more and more. And uh, one more important point that you highlighted is we should trust the established sources of, of whatever the news is coming from. Thank you so much, sir. The third question that we have in the chat box is for Behanas. So the question is, uh, can you give any tips for students on how to identify the fake news? Yes, thank you for the question, Sankeetna. I feel that there are two kinds of fake news today revolving around the internet. One would be stories that aren't true, and one would be stories that have some particular truth in them, but aren't 100% accurate. This could be maybe the journalist telling you only half the story, and then half the story being out of thin air, what you decide or what you think is correct. But there are many ways to actually stop the spread of fake news along with us being gullible enough to understand. One being developing a mindset. In today's day and age, students are so smart, but they don't have the reason to believe that news is actually fake when it comes on WhatsApp forwards especially. One of the main reasons of fake news could be an issue that is being people being so gullible and believing and then turning and then turning, understanding themselves to be reading what they've read after being in that emotion of anger that they don't actually check the veracity of the situation if that situation is particularly in being or authentic. One is another one is checking the source. Checking the web address of a particular source or a website you're reading from is of utmost importance today. With cyber crimes on the rise, you would rather wish to read from an ex extension being .com or .uk or .india rather than being a .offer or a .exe. Maybe one of the last tips would be see who's reporting the story because it is very important to know if the, if the source of the story is authentic in itself because anyone could, today could get up and start their own web page and say, Omicron does not exist and this is all a myth by the government because they do not want us to travel. So you, you definitely shouldn't believe fake news. Thank you. Thank you, Bhenas, for answering that question so clearly. It's it's a live example that we are seeing nowadays, especially in Corona. We have plethora of uh, WhatsApp messages on uh, different uh, things and people are really panicking about it. Thank you so much. The next question that we have is uh, what are the challenges of preventing the fake news proliferation via social media? Uh, Ms. Ovia, uh, I, we would like you to answer this question. I think it's difficult to control. Um, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Okay, okay. I think it's very difficult to actually monitor the amount of fake news that's actually entering into social media, that's spreading via social media, so it's uh, even in Instagram, for example, there has been um, measures taken whereby uh, members of uh, the ones who view uh, the story or the post, they can inform that this is misinformation by reporting. And even then, um, majority of the time, since there's just a vast number of uh, fake news that's circulating, it's very difficult for people to monitor. So I'm it's very difficult to, to actually put anything in force really, even it, like I mentioned, even Instagram had tried and, uh, and it's still not preventing people from spreading it. So I don't think there really is um, a measure as of right now that could stop uh, the spread of fake news. Thank you, Obia. This is uh, the true case. You, we are trying a lot, but fake news find their own way as Mr. Chevy <laughs> highlighted. So we have many questions coming up. I would uh, like to take the last two questions. Uh, the next question is, do you feel the government uh, use social media to influence the mind of their subjects, that is people to their advantage? I would like uh, Mr. Chevy sir, uh, to answer this question. Absolutely, without a doubt, um, I think, you know, there's so much that can be said about this, but the, the short answer is absolutely. Uh, whether it be for um, the purpose of informing, because it's, it's, it's much more difficult to get to 
especially particular demographics um, through other means. Uh, the use of newspapers on decline in uh, across the world. Most people are on social media. It has Facebook has what two billion subscribers. Then you have WhatsApp. You have Instagram. Most persons are on there. So with a combined approach, you're more more than likely to uh, reach the the complete. Um, stretch of demographic that you're aiming for. So definitely, government uses social media. I know, for example, the government of Guyana uses social media to publish information and work that it's doing. Uh, the embassies uh, have pages on Facebook. You have government, various government agencies publishing relevant information. You have political parties, which have their information on Facebook because and, and other media, uh, social media platforms because their their members are there. So absolutely. So it's it's not social media platforms which need to be limited or restricted. As my colleague also said, you can, you can try to have these entities perhaps include or involve in their software mechanisms to strain or try to prevent fake news, um, but it will prevail. But insofar as social media platforms remain a very important tool of uh, not just governments, but as we're having that conversation, governments, but other stakeholders in getting to their target audience, we're going to have continue to have that proliferation. But again, to iterate, to iterate, to reiterate, the simple answer is absolutely. Governments use, um, perhaps some governments use social media even more than some private citizens, I would say, in some instances. Absolutely. Right. So thank you so much. So we have the last question for this session. The question is, are there any ethical code of conduct as in form of legislation in India? I would like Ms. Chaturi Ma'am to answer this question. I guess uh, Ma'am is not here. Should I go ahead with uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Rav Nandini Ravishanko to answer this question? Uh, definitely Sankitra. See, uh, in India is such a country where uh, we have uh, nothing as such can be imposed on the people. And that was extremely evident when the government was coming up with uh, the WhatsApp privacy policy, which led to a lot of tussles and a lot of arguments in the parliament related to, because in India, uh, right to messaging and uh, talking something where your information is highly and thoroughly cryptic if I may say so, it's encrypted is something which is extremely a right to privacy of an individual. And somewhere, if you try to bring up a legislation on this aspect, uh, it will definitely not be taken with a lot of open mindedness because there will be a parochial reservation on the same. So coming up with a legislation, if not, if at all, is not a very uh, viable option for India, though having an authoritative body, maybe uh, um, I can say, up a body for rescuing this problem. But definitely, as I said, it all depends on the individual and your individual interpretation and how an individual draws a barrier to the limitation to check the veracity of the information. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Nandini Ravishankar. for answering the question. Now let's uh, uh, proceed to the resolution part. So can I have the resolution on the screen, please? I request everyone to vote for the motion. Uh, I'll read the resolution. We, the participants of the first international symposium on law and peace, hereby promise that we will not be influenced by any fake news and will not let its adverse effect impact us. We promise to adhere to the IT rules 2021 and to create awareness. Dear participants, we only have one minute to cast your valuable vote. Please vote.
I would request everyone to cast their valuable votes. So here we have the final votes that came in. We have 99% uh, of our participants supporting for yes and 1% is for no. So that's a great, uh, that's a great percentage. So thank you everyone for casting your valuable vote. Now let's move ahead to the next part of this session, which is uh, administering vote by our uh, third year, second year BBA LLB student, Ms. Yashvi Goel. Ms. Yashvi Goel, over to you. On the platform of MITWU's International Symposium on Law and Peace, be the sons and the daughters of Mother Earth, being the global citizens, is sure to abide by the duties and responsibilities of an ideal citizen, and hereby affirm that we will endeavor to promote peace and harmony through the lens of law in the pursuit of justice. Thank you, Ms. Yashvi Goel, for the vote. Uh, now, moving ahead, we have Mr. Anish Khare, third year BBA LLB student, who will propose the vote of thanks. Mr. Anish, over to you. Uh, thank you, Sankeetana. And uh, I'd, like just, I'd like to say that I am really honored to have been a part of this uh, seminar, wherein we heard such eminent speakers talk about the problem of fake news that our content-hungry generation suffers from today. Today, uh, a, a content-generating fake news we might be given more preference than an actual real news as well because that has become business. <clears throat> it is up to us to ensure that we verify the sources of our news and always understand what is true news. To give an example is that uh, when the Taliban has taken over Afghanistan, we have seen that our Taliban has tried to say that they are doing everything they can to promote peace and equality in the, in the country. However, it is the very people of Afghanistan who through the social media showed us the true picture of what is going on over there. In the end, I like just I like to thank everyone and say that it is up to us, the youth, to ensure that fake news doesn't become a problem that takes us century. Thank you. Thank you, Anish. Now, as we are reaching to the end of the session, according to the tradition of MIT World Peace University, we end our session by playing the universal anthem Pasayda. Let's all join hands and close our eyes and pray to the Almighty seeking his blessings. I, I request my technical